We divided now between obstetrics and gynecology. Um, um, so I run the gamut from um, prenatal all the way to death when it comes to women's health. Okay. And you said you've been doing that how long? Uh, I graduated medical school in 2002. I graduated residency in 2006, and so I've been in practice here since 2006. I was with Dr. Pettit when I first year out. Okay. And if you would give the uh, members of the jury an idea about your educational background, where you went to school. I know you said you graduated in 06. Yeah, so I started undergrad at uh, University of Cincinnati, and I spent uh, two and a half years there. I took a little sabbatical, and I finished up my undergrad at Ohio State University. I went to medical school at Ohio University in Athens, Ohio, and then I did my internship and residency, a combined internship residency in obstetrics and gynecology a split program between Athens, Ohio and Portsmouth, Ohio. And as soon as I finished, I stayed here. Okay. And do you have professional licenses or board certifications? Yes. Uh, so I'm licensed in Ohio, Kentucky, West Virginia, and Florida, and I'm a board-certified obstetrician gynecologist okay. through the American Osteopathic Obstetrics and Gynecology Board. Okay. See handy what's being marked as State's Exhibit 17 for our identification and records of reflect and showing that to the Doctor, do you recognize that document? <clears throat> yes. Okay, what is that? This is my CV. Okay, and so that just explains all the qualifications we just went over, your employment history, your educational background, yes. your licenses. Yes. Okay. Your Honor, at this time we've moved to have him uh, declared an expert uh, as an OBGYN. His expertise. No, Your Honor. No, Judge. No, Your Honor. We would so stipulate. Uh, Dr. Adams will be uh, found to be an expert in his field of obstetrics and gynecology. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, what that means is that Dr. Adams will be allowed to offer opinion testimony uh, in his field. Uh, continue. You may continue. Thank you, Your Honor. Doctor, let me direct your attention to January 2019, uh, specifically January 10th. Uh, did you have an opportunity to assist in the medical care of defendant Jessica Groves? Okay. I'm going to need you to speak up. It's, uh... I, sorry. Yes, I did. <laughs> okay. Um, explain to the jury how you became involved. Uh, they called me early in the morning uh, for some of the family to triage. It's our emergency rooms in the obstetrics unit for someone with no prenatal care and active labor, almost complete. Uh, so then I... I came to the hospital, and that's why I first met her. Okay. And approximately what time did you arrive? Um, if I recall the times, I think about 9, or excuse me, 654, something like that. I can't remember the actual numbers. I have to look at the numbers. Okay. All right. Um, explain to the jury what your role was there. Uh, I was on call for no prenatal care, walk-in patients for the uh, that morning, and for someone who has no prenatal care, I take care of those that walk in that need help. So I showed up and I evaluated okay. uh, the patient. You said you were on call? Yes. So do the OBGYNs rotate that call for? For no prenatal care, we do. For no prenatal care patients? Yes. Okay. And what medical history or information did you receive from your nursing staff regarding the defendant and her pregnancy prior to you actually treating her? Uh, just that, that she had no prenatal care and she was about to deliver a baby to get in here as soon as possible. Okay. Um, did you ask any questions directly of this defendant or her husband? I did. Okay. Explain did. to the jury what that was. Well, when I arrived to triage, she was nine and a half centimeters dilated. And for you that don't know, complete dilation prior to delivery is 10 centimeters dilated. So she was almost ready to deliver. So I made a quick examination of the patient and asked her some questions. Um, at that time, though, she was distant and didn't answer many of my questions. Okay. If you would explain to the members of the jury why prenatal care is important uh, for a mother to follow through with. Yeah, so prenatal care, it, it's the stalwart for us. We can help 
actually prenatal care actually starts with preconception care. So we like to optimize the female's body so that it can be receptive to a pregnancy and also we can identify any risk factors that we might have to take care of during the pregnancy that might optimize the environment of the mother and then optimize the outcome. Okay. And are there risks in not um, going to your prenatal care or well, seeking certainly. out prenatal care? Certainly. It depends on what's, what's in the history that we, that we have to look at. Uh, risk factors such as smoking, high blood pressure, other issues that we need to identify and optimize so we get a good outcome. Okay. And you said you did ask some questions of her and she did not answer? Very distant. She was distant. Uh, so directly, I can't remember her answering any questions at that time. Okay. Were there any pain medications or narcotics administered to this defendant? Not to my knowledge. Okay. Do you know why? Uh, normally, uh, women get epidurals prior to delivery. Uh, but she was so close to delivery, we don't give narcotics that close to delivery because the baby doesn't have an adverse reaction or uh, have a difficulty after de a delivery if we've got narcotic that close to delivery. Okay. What was her demeanor? Did she appear to be in pain like a normal patient would be a dilated Most patient? women, when they're complete, if they have no pain medica medication on board or no epidural, would be in extreme pain and showing that. Like I said, she was just distant and an odd reaction. Okay. Did she ask for pain medication? Not to my knowledge. Okay. About how long were you there before the baby was born? I think it was just several minutes. Okay, just several minutes? Yeah, like two to four minutes, I believe, once I got there and got her set for delivery and I had a baby. Okay. And once the baby's born, what do you do? Um, I deliver a child, I cut and clamp the cord, and then the nursery nurses take over. And then I watch for mom and I deliver the placenta. I check for tears, for lacerations at delivery. I repair them. And after that, my job is finished, and I normally leave. Okay. Do you recall having any specific concerns about this patient, um, given any information you received, or the fact that she didn't have any prenatal care? Well, there's always concerns when there's no prenatal care, because you never know what you're going to have. Uh, and during the course of that several minutes, it was brought to light that she had had some substance abuse in the last few days. And so that's something we have to take take into consideration with the child. Okay. Doctor, do you see in your practice uh, mothers that are have substance abuse issues or that are under the influence? Certainly. Okay. Certainly. Would you say that she was under the influence as she was there in labor that day? In my opinion, with her being so distant and acting not like we normally see, I believe she might have been impaired. Okay. Were you involved any further uh, in the care of Defendant Jessica Groves after the delivery? Yes. Um, so like I said, I left the room. They called me back after her blood pressure had dropped and she started having vaginal bleeding. Uh, they called, it's called a rapid response. So if her blood pressure drops and her vital signs go, there's a rapid response team at our hospital. That way we can have all people on board. Uh, they did arrive at the floor and called me and I did come to the floor to evaluate her for her vaginal bleeding. Okay. And do you know about how long of a time span between delivery of the baby and this issue? That was at 9.40ish or so, I believe. I could, okay. So uh, hours. Hours. A yeah, okay. couple hours later, yes. Uh, in between that time, were you notified of any problems uh, with the patient? Not at that time. Okay. If you would explain to the members of the jury what you did to treat the hemorrhage that she had there. Yeah, so she had no IV access. So I gave her some medication called Methergen. It's a medicine to clamp the uterus down to help stop bleeding. I also examined her uh, bottom and also cleaned out her uterus with, uh, it's called sponge forceps. She had some clots in there. Uh, cleaned that out. We rapidly got the uterus to clamp back down but she did have a significant amount of bleeding. Okay, and did she recover okay after that? 
Certainly. So after we got IV access, actually it was a central line that we had one of our physician assistants from the ICU come down and put in since we couldn't get peripheral IV access. Once we got her stabilized, we moved her to a different floor where we could monitor with an EKG on maternity. We can't monitor the baby or the mom's heart. So we had to move her to a different floor so we could monitor her. Uh, I think she spent the night, we gave her one unit of blood because her blood dropped. And I think we stabilized her and she was discharged home after that the next day. She was discharged home the next day? I believe it was the next day. Okay. Let me back up just a minute and ask you, uh, show you State Exhibit 18. Sir, you could identify the document that I just needed. Yes. What is that? That's the uh, newborn identification form. Okay. And how do you recognize it? Um, there's a footprint on there, and this is what the uh, nursery, to, uh, they perform this once the, the child's born and put on there. Okay, and does your signature appear on there? My name's at the top up top, and okay. the nursery nurses sign that. Okay, and it it, just, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, so my name is at the top, but my signature is not on here. The electronic stamp is on the bottom, but my hand signature is not on there. Okay. If I could put that up so the jury can see it. If you would, before I take that, because I'm not sure you'll be able to see it when we put it up there. It's not yes. as, the picture's not as good. Um, tell the members of the jury uh, the baby's weight, <coughs> length uh, upon delivery. Um... Yes. Sorry. Uh, five pounds, 10 ounces was the weight, and the length was 19 inches, and it was a male. Okay. Anything else you'd like? No, I'll put it up for you. Yes. Okay. And identifies information about the birth, right. height, weight, date of birth. Correct. Okay. I can have just a few minutes. Just a few more questions. Um, you said the delivery happened within minutes. Yes. Is that right? Um, would you call that an uneventful delivery? Uneventful. Okay. So no injuries to the baby as a result of birth? No injuries to the baby. Okay. Does that occur sometimes? Do the injuries occur? are injured while they're being born? Oh, uninjured? Most of the time that's, that's the way it happens, that they have no injuries at all with birth. Okay. But it does occur sometimes? Occasionally you do have injuries at birth. Okay. Baby Dylan did not have any injuries as a result of his birth. Not at all. Okay. I think that's all I have at this time. Ms. Hutchinson, uh, Mr. Stratton, you may cross-examine. Yes, Your Honor. Good morning, Dr. Adams. Good morning, sir. Uh, just a few questions. Um, you said you asked some questions of Jessica. Um, do you remember what those questions were? I'm just trying to get uh, past medical history from her. Okay. Um, could you give an example of some of those questions? Yeah, I normally, I typically ask, and this is what I ask her, uh, past medical history, past surgical history, any medication she's currently on, or any illicit substances. And how did you describe her earlier? Distant. Distant. Um, could you explain that a little bit more about what you mean by distant? Distant. Well, in my opinion... She was, uh, lack of terms here, uh, not aloof, 
not responding to my questions. Not responding. Yeah. Okay. Was she not? She was alert, but not responding. Okay, that's what I was going to ask. That she, if she was alert and able to answer your questions, did she seem like she was in pain or? Not for someone at that stage of, of labor. Okay. Um, Dylan, was he delivered early? Was he delivered early? What? Uh, he wasn't full term, was he? At the time with no prenatal care, it's hard to tell at that in that time frame. Okay. So you're not sure at that time when you were delivering how many weeks he was? With no prenatal care, there's no way to ascertain that at the time. Okay. All right. No further questions, John. Mr. Stratt, Ms. Scott, you may cross-examine the witness. I believe that you stated that you were approximately um, in the room a very short period of time, correct? Just minutes and then correct. you had some after um, care and follow up with the mom, is that correct? Correct. Um, both parents were in the room or do you recall? I do recall him being in the room. Okay, you do recall Mr. Groves being in the room. Yes. Did you have any direct conversations with Mr. Groves that you can recall? I don't recall that. Okay. Um, so you do not know if he participated in any of the uh, questions, or you probably may not have been directing your questions to him. I don't recall that. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Any further questions, Ms. Scott? No further questions. Thank you. Any redirect? No, Your Honor. Is this witness free to go? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Stratt? Yes, Your Honor. Ms. Scott? Excused. Doctor, you're free to go. Thank, Thank you, you for your much. time today. State may call their next witness. Your Honor, the state would uh, call back to the stand Patricia Kraft. Ma'am, you were sworn in yesterday, but since this is a new day, I'm going to administer an oath again. Can you raise your right hand? You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. And please have a seat. Ma'am, I asked you yesterday, do you object, uh, there's media in the courtroom, do you object to your image being filmed or photographed during your testimony? Yes. Witness has objected, we'll direct that the camera be lowered and there will be no uh, photography uh, of her image during her testimony. Tiedemann, you may continue your direct examination of the witness. Thank you, ma'am. Just for the record, could you state your name again? Patricia Kraft. All right. All right, ma'am, uh, we've already talked about how this case got started, so we're not going to start from scratch. We're going to pick up where we left off. Um, let's get this out of the way right now, however. Um, ma'am, would you agree that whether it was through a safety plan or custody with a case plan, uh, there was all of a decision to place a child into the care of the father? It was decided that if he could pass the drug screen and the cat was negative that the child would be placed with him only okay so and at this point in time uh, and if I'm referring to page 2 of 89 from the activity logs that uh, should be in front of you there um, on January 11th do you see that Uh, that uh, references as uh, one of the records of Children's Services that there was a, a caseworker or an investigator named Lauren Johnson who did a drug screen on that date. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And on that date, according to the records, Daniel tested negative for any substances. He was negative. All right. And that went into part of uh, the whole safety plan that Investigator Johnson was working on at that point. Correct. Okay. So. Is it fair to say there were some initial understandings from dad uh, by Children's Services? Uh, was he to have a steady job? Yes. Did he, according to Children's Services knowledge at that time, have a steady job? Yes, he did. Where did he work? He stated he worked at Rural King in Waverly. All right. And was he to be drug free? Yes. Did he indicate to Children's Services he didn't have a problem with drugs? Yes. Did he also indicate if there was a difference between um, or a conflict between his children and his wife, did he indicate 
who he would side with? No. His children. Okay. So that was an understanding, too. If something came up, he's going to take the children's side. Yes. Did he indicate whether or not he would protect his children from harm? Yes, he did. And who made these representations to you or your agency? Mr. Groves. By the way, do you know how drug screens were done by Children's Services in January of 2019? The, the person comes in, they go to the bathroom, they are told not to flush the toilet or turn on the water. Does an agent from Children's Services follow them into the restroom? No, we stand beside the door. All right, is the door open or closed? It's usually cracked. It depends on the worker. All right. Do you observe the urine come from the person into the cup? Yes. No. No. You do not? We don't observe it. No. Okay. Now, you've had a chance to review this record, and you were intimately involved in the case as a caseworker, correct? Correct. Uh, is it fair to say that Children's Services put some requirements on the dad uh, if he were to receive placement uh, of this child? Yes. All right. um, first, was there an understanding that he would have to work with Children's Services? Yes. Was there an understanding that uh, there would be uh, weekly contact with Children's Services? In, with the investigator, once it came over to me, it would have been a seven-day follow-up appointment home visit, then a four-week, and then monthly after that. Was there an understanding that um, if you were to call them and try to get a hold of them, he would have to contact you back? Yes. Was there an understanding that mother would receive drug treatment? Yes. Was there an understanding that mother could not be in the home except for supervised business? Yes. Was there an understanding that dad would remain employed and not have any drug issues? Yes. Was there an understanding that uh, the parents would apply for any public benefits that would be available for the child? Yes. What kind of public benefits would they need to apply for? They would apply for food stamps, but we would keep the medical card because he would be in our custody. Okay. And of course they would get WIC. All right. Were there any other agencies they needed to cooperate with to effectuate the public uh, benefit? We use we send referrals to help me grow for every infant. And did you do so in this case? Yes. And I apologize. I might have mentioned. And mom was to continue to have drug treatment. Mother was to continue to have drug treatment and go to drug court and individual and counseling. All right. And who assured you that these things would happen? Mr. Groves and Jessica Groves. Ultimately, was the child being Dylan Groves, baby Dylan, removed from the custody of the parents? We obtained temporary custody of Dylan. And as part of that custody, if Children's Services wanted the child to be produced, are the parents or the people the child was placed with responsible for bringing that child to Children's Services? Yes. Are they required to do so? Yes. Your Honor, may I approach? You may approach. Let the record reflect on handing the witness, uh, after showing the counsel what the market states exhibit. 10, 11, 12. Ma'am, if you could, could you uh, tell the jury what those three documents are? It is an order that um, the underlying request of protective order vesting in the custody of Dillon in Scioto County Children's Services Board. All right, so we've got in front of you, and I'm going to put them up here on the other side. Uh, 
I'm going to go through them again. Right? Okay. State Exhibit 10 here. In the matter of Dillon Groves and Daniel Groves. All right. And what I have on the screen here is States Exhibit 10. And this is, uh, you can find on the right side what this document purports to be. Um, what is this document I have up here on the screen? I can't really see it. Is that a complaint? Complaint, yeah. Uh, and so is this the complaint that Children's Services initially filed to obtain custody of... Uh, Yes. I'll take the other ones from you here. State Exhibit 11. It's the affidavit. All right. What's, what's the affidavit? That is where the investigator goes and types up a filing summary, and it is um, signed and entered into the court when she goes to testify. Okay. So uh, when a child is removed from, or when Children's Services wishes to remove a child from uh, his or her parents, um, those are, are those the documents they file with the court? Yes. And uh, the in this particular case, do you recall if uh, those that complaint alleged an emergency at the time? I'm not. I'm unaware of that one. Okay. Well, let me ask it this way: Was court uh, was the child removed at the hospital? Yes. All right. And uh, was there a court order at that point to remove the child? Yes. Okay. Are you sure? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm checking my records. No, there was no court order. Okay. So then, after the removal, they had to get an emergency order before the next day, is that it? Yes. Okay. And then, we have State Exhibit 12 here. Uh, is this, what is this document? That's the entry from the court. Okay. So, this is the court's order uh, from the complaint? Yes. That, okay. And then this order, who is custody vested with, um, with regard to Bill and Rose? Children's Services. Okay. These three exhibits, exhibits 10, 11, and 12, uh, do those appear to be accurate copies of juvenile court uh, pleadings? Yes. Um, who was, uh, when, when you remove a child from, its, from his or her parents, um, where does the child go? Where does he go? Where does any child go? When, what's the procedure? When a child is removed, if we cannot find kinship care or family to take care of them, we will call uh, foster parents and other agencies to see if they would have placement. In this particular case, who was the child initially placed with? Andrea Bowling. Okay. And uh, who is Andrea Bowling to the child? Foster parent. Okay. Uh, is she with the Children's Services Foster Care Network? Yes. Okay. And um, tell me about Andrea Bowling. Um, she was called by uh, the investigator to see if she would take placement of Dylan, in which she did, and she went to the hospital and picked him up. Okay. 
Um, I, I think you testified earlier yesterday that you were previously a foster parent. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Yes. Uh, what are the what kind of training do you have to have to become a foster parent? You have to have 36 hours of training, and then yearly you have to have 24. Okay. Um, what kind of training is that? It goes from abuse to um, sexual abuse all the way up to um, delinquents, how to care for them, drug treatment, and that they have to follow the court orders as well as you do. Okay. And to your knowledge, did Ms. Bowling have that training? Yes. And um, was she under those requirements to care for Dylan Grove? Yes. And uh, did she take Dylan, to your knowledge, to all his medical appointments? Yes. Did she take Dylan, uh, or did she contact the various agencies to help or assist with the public benefits? Yes. Did she maintain contact with Children's Services? Yes, with the investigator. Did she fully comply with every request that Children's Services made of her? Yes. Were there any problems or concerns with baby Dylan from his time with Ms. Bowling? Yes, the time that uh, it was decided that Dylan was to go with his dad. Okay. Um, let me back up a step, though. With regard to how she treated Dylan and cared for Dylan, were there any concerns with Children's Services about her care of Dylan? No, no. Okay. All right. When did you first begin casework services in this matter? I was transferred the case on um, January the 25th. Okay. And if you need to refer to the, the record or your notes, feel, feel free. Um, I might direct you from time to time if we ask about specific activity law. All right. So on, I'm going to refer to you page 18 of 89. Uh, the date, uh, January 24th. Yes. All right. Uh, was there uh, any kind of meeting at Children's Services that day? It was a family team meeting. Okay. Were you part of the family team meeting? Yes. All right. Um, who else was part of the family team meeting? Caseworker Johnson, Miss Bowling, and the parents of Dylan. All right. And um, when, when did you first meet the parents of Dylan? On the 25th okay. at this meeting. Okay. At this meeting? Okay. Um, and I think I already had you identify them earlier. Um, who are the parents of Dylan Groves? Daniel is with the black and white shirt and Jessica is with the white Carnegie. All right. And they are the parents of Dylan Grove? Yes. All right. And so they were at this meeting? Yes. Did they arrive timely to the meeting? They was a little late. How late? Probably about 15 minutes. Okay. And uh, was there anything to follow the meeting with Children's Services? They had a visit. Okay. Uh, what kind of visit did they, were they supposed to have? Just a, an hour visit. All right. Where does that take place? It happens in the um, conference room. Okay. or in the visitation room in the other building. Okay. But theirs was in the conference room. Okay. Um, so, so everybody knows where it is. Where's Children's Services located? 3940 Gallia Street, okay, New Boston. New Boston, Ohio. Okay, so, and that facility has the administrative uh, offices there? Yes. And it also has rooms for conferences? Yes. It also has uh, play areas, for lack of a better word, recreational areas for, for kids? Yes. Okay. So it's the one, if I drive towards Portsmouth, uh, if I look on my left, there's a, an older style building and then like a little playground and a, um, like a modular building beside it. Yes. Okay. okay. And the conference room, was it in the main building? Yes, main building. Um, and um, was any decision made with regard to the family team meeting at that point regarding the placement of Dylan Groves? Not at that time. Okay. And what was discussed in the team meeting? We introduced ourselves. I um, asked if there was any concerns with Dylan, and um, then the parents came in, and they was introduced to the foster parent. Okay. 
Now, there's another son I don't want to leave out. Um, they have another child? Yes. Who's that? Daniel Groves, Jr. All right. How old is Daniel Groves? 14. 14. Um, was there any plan or care for Daniel? No. Daniel was still at his dad's okay. with dad. Okay. And what was the reasoning behind that? Because Daniel, Daniel Jr. had said that he had never seen his mom and dad do anything in front of him. Okay. And he was 14. Mm -hmm. Is there a difference between a 14-year-old's uh, ability to report an issue and a baby? 14-year-old can report, a newborn can't. Okay. All right, so we have this team meeting. Um, did you go over the rules and requirements that Children's Services was going to have of the patient, or of the patient, of the parents at this meeting? We did. We told her that she needed the drug assessment and alcohol assessment. She needed individual counseling, and she needed to comply with court orders. And were the responsibilities and requirements that Dad had to follow as well? Yes. He had to do the same thing. Okay. Uh, so that was followed, you mentioned, by a, a, a visit, a visitation? Yes. Were you part of the visitation? No. Was any um, work or children's services part of the visitation? No. Uh, who was in the visitation? Jessica and Daniel and Dylan. Okay. Initially, was Andrea Bowling part of the visitation? She was there, and then she left. Okay. Is that normal, that they give them time with their, they give the baby time with the parents without foster care parent or a children's services worker there? Unless it's court ordered to be supervised. Okay. To your knowledge, was there a specific court order with regard to a visit to children's services no. being supervised? No. There's okay. no order. During this time period, um, what was Children's Services doing uh, to, to, to effectuate their goals? We was making referrals to help me grow, and Ms. Johnson had called Mahajan. Okay. What is Mahajan? Mahajan is a uh, drug and counseling center. Okay. It's so located here locally? It's in New Boston. All right. So we have, um, and help me grow, is it here locally as well? Yes. Okay. So we have the agency, uh, through one of its workers, um, contacting these and starting to set up a process for the, for the services for the parents. Yes. And at some point, uh, was there a change in the placement of baby Bill? Yes. When was that? The, ch the change was on January the 28th is when he was to pick up Dylan. Okay. How, how was the change, how did the change happen? It was, uh, there was a conversation going on between Ms. Johnson and the supervisor that if he could pass another drug screen that he would be able to get Dylan back because he had no violent criminal history, he had no, no involvement with CPS and that he passed his drug screen. Okay. And uh, was he uh, able to pass a drug screen at that point? Yes. And who administered that drug screen? I did. Okay. And you indicated before how you administered the drug screen uh, that uh, did he uh, explain how that drug screen went? He came into the building. I uh, showed him where the restroom was. I told him not to flush the toilet or run the water. He went in, I stood at the door, and I had it cracked open. Okay. Uh, prior to that drug screen, did you search him? Make no. Make a search? No. Okay. Um, uh, you stayed outside. Did you have uh, visual on him um, providing the sample? No. Okay. Uh, that sample came back clean? Clean. All right. And uh, from there... Um, were arrangements made with the foster mom to give custody, not custody, placement of Dylan to his father. Yes. Um, 
Were there any concerns you'd mentioned earlier? There was con concerns with the foster mom about that. Yes. Uh, what were her concerns? The concerns was um, that he had a criminal history and that he was okay, had a I'll stop you there. Um, you indicated he didn't have any violent criminal history, correct? Right. There was no violence. Okay. All right. Um, did she indicate anything about her observations during the... Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, during uh, testimony a few minutes ago, you heard some unsubstantiated claims about a criminal record of one of the defendants in this matter from a person who has not testified, or at least not yet testified. You must not speculate and consider that evidence for any purpose. You must not speculate as to whether or not that is true or not true. Uh, the, we get into that later. We'll address that at that time. Can you all follow my instruction on this matter? Is there anyone that feels that they cannot? None of the jurors have indicated they cannot follow my instruction. We'll expect you not to consider that portion of the testimony, and it will be stricken. Mr. Teeman, you may continue. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Ma'am, uh, with regard to the visitation and the concerns expressed by Ms. Bowling, were there concerns addressed by Ms. Bowling as to her observations of the demeanor or the condition of the parents during this visitation? It was stated that the, she thought they was loopy. Okay. That Miss Groves was loopy. Okay. Did she make any concerns about the demeanor of Mr. Groves? No. Okay. Did she further explain what, according to the records, what she meant by loopy? That she was uh, on drugs. Okay. All right. Uh, so at this point, is it fair to say that you've taken over the primary role in this case for Children's Services Board? Yes. Okay. And uh, was Mr. Groves under the same requirements uh, that uh, he'd initially made, that he, he be clean and, and not addicted to drugs, that he be employed, that mom only be in the home on supervised visits, um, that she would continue to do drug treatment, and that he would protect his children? Yes. What was your next uh, step in your caseworker responsibilities to make sure that the placement um, w that the Dylan was handed over to Mr. Groves on Monday all right and how did that go I was not there I was in El Dorado Ohio it took place with my supervisor okay uh, any indications from the record or from your knowledge that there was any issues with the transition they was a little late that's all I was told okay who was late Mr. Groves all right so Mr. Groves was late for picking up his son? Yes. Okay. And uh, when was your next contact supposed to be with Mr. Groves? I was supposed to go out on February the 1st, which is a Friday. Uh, but due to the road conditions, I was not able to go, so I scheduled it for Monday the 4th. Okay. So was that the date where um, you were actually going to also go with uh, Stephanie Jenkins from Help Me Grow? Yes. Okay. Um, that's not a usual thing. That's not a requirement that she go with you at that point, but you guys were going that day together? Yes. Okay. And um, so when did, when did you conduct the home visit? I conducted it on February the 4th okay. at 2 o'clock. Could you describe uh, the location of the home uh, inside of County, Ohio? Once you turn into the holler, you go up. And then the trailer is back off in the woods a little bit. Okay. Um, is this in, uh, in or near Otway, Ohio? Otway. Okay. And what was the address of the home? 2241 Mount Hope Road. Okay. In Otway? In Otway. And is that inside of County, Ohio? Yes. All right. Um, is the driveway paved or gravel or, or what? It's dirt. Dirt driveway? Yeah. Okay. Um, on February 4th, what was the weather like that day? 
cold and raining. Cold and rain. All right. What were the conditions on the driveway? Muddy. Muddy. Um, what time did you get there? Are you about 1:55? Okay. It's a stupid question, but I want to make sure that's the afternoon, right? You yes. You get there at 1:55 in the morning. Yep. Okay. Um, who was at the residence when you got there? Jessica and Daniel Groves and Dylan. What about Daniel Jr.? He was not home from school yet. Okay. Where does he go to school? Northwest. Northwest High School? Middle school then. Middle school then? Yes. Okay. Um, is there a corresponding uh, note or activity log for this visit? Yes. Is that on page 29 of 89? Yes. At that point, uh, had these other, these other services been set up for the family? They've been scheduled. Okay. What was scheduled? Uh, the Help Me Grow was supposed to go out on the first, but she said she would go uh, another time. But Mah she was already in Mahajan, so. Okay. Who was already in Mahajan? Miss Groves. Okay. Jessica Groves? Jessica Groves. Okay. Uh, was there any conversation at that point about... Um, what you expected from the parents. It was asked if uh, she needed to continue to go to Mahajan, and I told her that she needed to go until further notice. Okay. Were there any issues with the home itself? No. Uh, were there any uh, issues with the surrounds of the home? No. Were there appropriate uh, facilities or um, uh, items to care for baby Dylan. Yes, actually, Mr. Groves was putting in a crib at that time. Okay. And that he had to go back and get a piece that they left out. Did Did uh, Ms. Groves, Mrs. Groves, ask about or, or or mention why she inquired about if she had to continue to go to Mahajan? Because it conflicted with drug court. Okay. Um, and you informed her that she had to go over to Mahajan over drug court? No. Okay. She needed to continue both. Okay. How did you explain to do that? I just, she would have had to work with Mahajan to schedule around it. Okay. Because she needed to go. Is that something that a drug facility will do to schedule around the drug yes. court? Yes. Okay. All right. Did you have an opportunity to observe baby Dylan at this February 4th meeting? Yes. Uh, do you recall what he was wearing that time? A long sleeve sleeper. Okay. What what is a? Could you describe a long sleeve sleeper? It's a uh, like a long sleeve uh, with feet in it, and it zips up. Okay. All right. So it's it's a full full, full body mm -hmm. zipper. Was he wearing a hat? No. Did you have an opportunity? How how did you observe Baby Dylan? Jessica was holding him when I was there. Okay. And um, did you have an opportunity to hold the baby? No. Did you have an opportunity to, to touch or manipulate the baby? No. Okay. Um, so from your visual observations, that were there any injuries to Dylan? No. Was he making any kind of cries of pain uh, or uh, anything of that nature? No. Uh, what was his demeanor? He was quiet. She, she was burping him. Anything else eventful happen at this uh, February 4th meeting? Daniel Jr. came home from school and I introduced myself. Okay. Uh, did Daniel Jr. say anything to you? No, he said everything was going good. Okay. No concerns reported? No concerns. No medical issues shared? No. No indicia from anyone that there was anything amiss? No. After this home visit, during the next few weeks, what was your understanding of what's going to be happening in the, in the case plan and, and uh, with the parents? That she's going to continue going to counseling, get in, continue going to drug court, schedule a parenting class. 
With regard to care of the baby, were there any other things that they needed to do for the baby? Well, she, the baby did have a doctor appointment on Thursday of that week. Okay. And to your knowledge, uh, did the baby attend the doctor's appointments? Not to my knowledge. Okay. Well, let's talk about, uh, were there times during this period that Mr. Gross failed to contact you? Yes. Well, let's talk about the first time uh, that he failed to do so. And if you could refer to whatever note you're looking at for. February the 21st. Okay, and what page are you on on the record? It would be 30 of 89. Okay, thank you. Um, so, what did you document with regard to contacts on February 21st? Caseworker had made multiple phone attempts to contact Daniel. Caseworker left messages but have not had a return call. Caseworker was worried, so caseworker and another caseworker went to the address listed on case and no one was home. Caseworker staffed with Lisa Thomas who instructed us to go to the school and talk to Daniel Jr. Okay. Um, let me back you up. So, um, it said multiple phone attempts. Um, when did these phone calls start happening? Early in the morning. Okay. Uh, what day did they start happening? On the 21st. Okay. Were there any phone call attempts between uh, when you saw them and February 4th and February 21st? No. Okay. So these are, these are calls that were that morning? Yes. Um, had there been any discussion of a work schedule before that for... Uh, um, Mr. Groves. Mr. Groves informed me prior to the, this day that he had six months of time saved up at Rural King and he was taken off. So he was going to take off. Okay. And um, did he indicate um, in that period of time that they were going on any trips to you? No. Did he indicate that there might be times where he has to have a sitter for the baby? No. Did he indicate any reason at all why he wouldn't be home with the child? No. Had he provided you with what you thought were good phone numbers to contact him? Yes. And so at this point, uh, you, how, how again did you try to get a hold of Mr. Groves? Me and another caseworker went to the school and talked to Daniel, and I gave him a note that had his dad to call me ASAP. Okay. And... Uh, were there any other steps to get a hold of Mr. Groves? We left notes in the door and in the, news, uh, the mailbox that I was there. Okay. Um, so you went back to the residence that day on February 21st? Yes. Uh, did you see anyone at the residence that day? We uh, actually saw Daniel Jr. walking once he got off the bus. Okay. Um, back to this period of February 24th or February 4th through 21st. Was Help Me Grow also trying to contact the family? Yes. Were they successful to your knowledge? No. Um, did you notice anything different about uh, the residence or the property when you went to the property on the 23rd? Other than there was a chain across the road and it said no trespassing and there was two dogs. Did you see any cars there at the address? Not the, red, not the, cab, the little red car they had was gone. All right. Um, what was your next action after that? I tried face-to-face -face contact on contact on the next morning. No cars was there. Was that Friday, February twenty-second? Yes. Uh, between your contact on the twenty-first and your point on the twenty-second, had you received any? Any kind of contact from the Groves family? No. Um, what was the next step to try to contact them? The next step was on um, the 25th. I'm, I completed my monthly uh, home visit. Dylan appeared to be clean and appropriate dress. Right. Had they gotten a hold of you between... Uh, when you left your note on the uh, 21st and uh, the 25th? No. Um, had, um, did you leave another note on the 22nd as well? Yes. All right. Um, so during this period, you left several notes, well, three, 
Three notes? Three notes. All right, one with Dylan Jr., one in the mailbox, and a second one in the mailbox? And a card in the door. And a card in the door. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you get there on the uh, 25th of February, correct? Yes. All right, and was there any explanation given as to why they didn't call you back? Uh, they said they went to the doctor on the 21st. Okay. Um, but no call after, did they acknowledge getting the notes? Did not. All right. So tell us about this visit on the uh, 25th of February. Who all was there? Daniel and Jessica and Dylan. How was Dylan? Dylan was fine. Daniel had stated that he went to the doctor and he weighed eight pounds and nine ounces and was 22 inches long. All right. And you're referring to your note on page 31 uh, of 89 of the yes. activity log? Yes. Okay. Um, was everything at the house appropriate? Yes. Uh, was there any issues brought up by Daniel to you? No. Was there any concerns at this point uh, about... Uh, issues with the with his requirements under the case plan no was there any concerns brought up about uh, Jessica's compliance with the case plan Jessica was not spending the night there she was there during the day but she was not living there uh, who told you that Daniel okay um, certainly in this time period were you guys going out at night and checking to see if she were there not at that time okay so at that point you're relying on Daniel's representations that Jessica is not sleeping there. Yes. Uh, do you recall what, and I know it's been a year, but what, do, you, do you recall what baby Dylan was wearing uh, on this visit? It was cold that day, so he was wearing a long sleeve sleeper. Okay. Anything on his head? Nope. You're inside a house. Is the house warm? Yes. Okay. Uh, did Dylan have a lot of hair not a lot it was starting to grow could you see the scalp and, and, and the skull yes were there any injuries that you noted to the scalp or the skull no right. any injuries to Dylan in any other way no did you inquire if everyone was keeping their appointments yes and did either parent indicate uh, that uh, they weren't keeping their appointments? No, they said they was keeping them. All right. uh, did, uh, was Daniel there when you inquired? Junior or? Senior, uh, Daniel yes, Senior. Yes, he was. Okay. And uh, did he volunteer anything to the contrary? No. Did either parent did indicate that Mrs. Gross had not been compliant with her drug treatment since February 8th? No. At that point, had Mrs. Groves given any indication, any clear indication of where she was staying at night? Friends and family. Any other details besides that? That was it. Was, your, was, that your, was your impression that that was a multiple locations? Yes. Did either of them ever admit to you that she was staying at the residence more than allowed? No. Did Mr. Groves ever take you aside and say, hey, things aren't what they're supposed to be? Never. When was the next time you were supposed to See the father. Three eighteen. Had there been a time that um, I'll strike that. What was the three eighteen visit supposed to be? And my monthly home visit.
Um, where was that? Was that visit to take place there at Mount Hope Road? Yes. And did the visit take place that day? Not that day. Why not? I got a text. I got a call stating that he was in Canton, Ohio, with his father who had a heart attack, and he needed to schedule it for Thursday at 9 a.m. Okay, and this is referring to your note on page 32 of 89? Yes. Dated 3-18-2019? Okay. So when did that call come in? That morning. When were you supposed to be at the home? That morning. Okay. Was this a sudden thing for, according to the text? Yes. Okay. Uh, did, were you able to ever confirm that story? No. Did you make attempts to confirm the story? Later on. Okay. Was the visit rescheduled? Yes. When was it rescheduled to? 321. Did that visit occur? No. All right, so you're, you're looking initially probably at page 32 of 89 to page 33, is that yes. correct? Okay. So that morning, um, was it the morning that you went to the home? Yes. Uh, and was there anyone there? No. Had you received any call uh, at that point uh, uh, from, uh, from uh, Mr. Groves? A voicemail. Okay. When did the voicemail come in, you know? After I got back in the office. Okay. That's when I got it. And what did the voicemail say? That his dad got worse and he is still in Canton. All right. And did you recognize Mr. Groves' voice on the voicemail? Yes. Okay. When's the next time you saw anyone um, uh, with regard to the Groves case? 327. And what happened on that day? We had our hearing here at uh, juvenile court. Uh, Jessica Groves showed up, but Daniel didn't. Okay. And a hearing, um, we talked about the process early on in your um, testimony yesterday. Um, uh, this hearing, uh, was it referred to as an adjudication? Yes. Okay. And what's the adjudication about, basically? That's where the um, investigator testifies of why she removed Dylan. Okay. I'm actually going to hand you what been marked States Exhibits 13 and 14. Um, I'm going to back up a minute. Remember when we had that discussion of the ex parte emergency order that was put on by the judge? Yes. Um, would there be another order confirming that? Should be. Okay. I'm going to put up on the screen here. Well, I'll hand it to you first after I press counsel. Uh, states Exhibits 13 and 14. We're handing you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 13. Do you recognize that document? Yes. What is that document? It is the uh, decision. Okay. Is that the decision for the uh, initial, confirming the initial uh, emergency order? Yes. And does that decision uh, keep custody of children's service? Yes. All right. And that's dated January the 28th. January 28th, okay. So I'm going to put it up here on the screen. Uh, the State Exhibit 13 appear to be a true and accurate copy of the uh, court entry. Yes. Okay. So this came off the problem calls on January 17th, 2019. Is that correct? Yes. All right. So with that, uh, this entry. Is it fair to say this entry basically confirms that emergency removal of the time? Yes. Does it provide any additional detail other than command and custody of children's service? That's it. Okay. I have in front of you what's marked as State's Exhibit 14. Uh, could you identify that for the court? That is the entry of the court of the adjudication that was held on March the 27th. Okay, and this is the date we were talking about before I remembered I hadn't given you the other one, right? Yes. Okay. Um, were you at that adjudication? Yes. Who all was there? Um, myself, our attorney, their attorneys, and Jessica Groves. Okay. And um, would Dylan be at that adjudication? Dylan was not at that. Okay. And, and that's not, not abnormal for the child to be at the adjudication, is that correct? Right. Okay. And um, was Mr. Groves at that adjudication? No. 
Was he supposed to be? Yes. Are you required to be present at all court hearings? Yes. Did you get a chance to talk to the mother, uh, Jessica Groves, about, about uh, him uh, not getting there? Yes. Did she indicate where he was? No. Did she indicate she knew where he was? No. Did you ask her where he was? No. Did anybody ask her where he was? I don't know what the attorneys asked him. Okay. And just for the record, I'm placing on the overhead of March 6th, it's in the 14th. In this adjudication, uh, who did custody uh, of Dylan Grove stay with? Children's Services. And then our exhibits uh, 12, 13, and 14 for 13, 14 true and accurate copies of the entries from juvenile court. Yes. Uh, did you inform the mother of any anything that was going to happen the next day? I gave her a card and told her if she sees Daniel's that I'll be Daniel. I'll be at his house on March the twenty eighth at eight a.m. All right, and that's the next day after the hearing. Yes. Had you heard from Daniel um, at that point? No. Now, uh, on March 28th, you indicated you were going to be out at the home at 8 a.m. Yes. Uh, and I believe we would be on page 33 and 34 of your activity log. Is that correct? Yes. Um, were you able to see some individuals at the home that day? Yes. Uh, who all was there? Daniel, Jessica, and Dylan. Did Daniel explain to you where he was when he should have been in court? No. Did you inquire? No. Is missing court a big thing? Depends on the parent. All right. For you, is it a big thing? There's a lot that don't come. Okay. What kind of people don't come to court? Ones that's hiding stuff. Uh, Just some speculation. I'll withdraw the question. Um, when someone misses court, uh, who is a parent in your case load, um, do they often explain why they miss court? No. And again, Mr. Groves did not explain any rationale for missing court the day before. Correct. Did he talk about his trip to Canton? No. Did he talk about his ill grandfather? No. Who else, who was there at the home? Jessica Groves and Dylan and Daniel. Daniel Sr.? Yes. Okay. And how was Dylan? Dylan was taking a bottle when I got there. Who was feeding him? Jessica. Do you recall what he was wearing? A long sleeve sleeper. Okay. Uh, was he making any crying or any other sounds? No. Um, was there a point where he wasn't taking the bottle when you were there? Yes. When was that? When I was getting ready to leave. Did he make any sounds then? No. Uh, who was holding him at that point? Jessica. Um, was Dylan manipulated or moved around uh, from your observations at that point? No. Was Dylan wearing a hat? No. You indicated he was wearing a sleeper. You described one earlier. Is that the same style? Yes. Long sleeves, pant legs? Yes. Uh, did you note any injuries to his head? No. If his head were swollen or black and blue, would you have noticed that? Yes. Did 
Did Ms. Groves ask you anything about her case plan? They just ensured me that the parent, they was keeping all scheduled appointments. All right. So who's assuring you of that? Both of them. All right. So both of them, you're saying all appointments are kept? Yes. Did they indicate they were going to drug court? Yes. Did they indicate they were going to counseling at Mahajan? Yes. Did they talk about uh, Jessica's sobriety? That she was maintaining her Mahajan appointments. Okay. And who again assured you these things were happening? Both Jessica and Daniel. Did they ask you about, did one of them or both of them ask you about Jessica getting to be back in the home? Yes, they asked if um, there was any possibility for Jessica to come back in the home so she can bond with Dylan. What were your indications at that point? I stated I had to take, take it to the supervisor. Um, did you discuss with them upcoming appointments or uh, anything of that nature? I told them that they had another court hearing on April the 3rd. Before April 3rd, were there any attempts to contact Daniel or Jessica? There was one on the 28th with Jessica. I got no response. Was this after your home visit? After I had left, yes. Was there an attempt to contact Daniel after your home visit? I texted Daniel's phone also on the same day, asking him to call me. He texted back and said he would call me just as soon as he gets signal. That he had been sitting with Jessica after I left this morning. He stated she went to the bathroom and had a spell with her UTI and she was sick and was trying to get into the doctor. Been waiting on a call back. He stated he was taking her to the ER and will call caseworker in a minute. Caseworker stated, call me when you get a chance, not a hurry. Let me ask you, um, uh, were you able to tell if there's any kind of uh, phone signals out in Otway where they live? Very limited phone service. It's, you can get a text better than you can get a phone call. All right, because I noticed a lot of these interactions are via text. Correct. Was that the reason? Yes. Okay. And uh, did uh, Mr. Groves call you back that day? No. What day again was that? 28th? 28th. Did Mr. Groves call you the next day? No. Or text you or contact no. you in any way? No. What about the day after that? No. Till. April the 3rd is the last time that I had um, texted him. Okay. So during this period of time, you're, you're, you're making other texts or attempts to contact mm -hmm. them? What was supposed to happen on April 3rd? Court hearing. Juvenile court? Juvenile court. And did the court hearing go forward? It was rescheduled for April the 18th. Between April 3rd and April 18th, um, did you attempt to contact um, uh, Mr. Groves? Prior before that, on the day that I visited on March the 28th, I had scheduled my next appointment for, for April the 9th. Okay. What uh, note are you looking at there? I'm on the 4-3 on page 35. Okay, thank you. Did Mr. Groves specifically text you on April 4th? Yes. All right. What did he say? Stated that everything was okay and do, going great. He explained that his and Jessica's phone has minutes on them right now, so he borrowed a government phone. 
Daniel stated he'd text Monday, but he realized it was the wrong number and that him and the phones tended not to get along. Daniel stated that he was sick for a few days, which started on Friday and lasting through Tuesday and is still feeling in somewhat. He continued to say that Jessica is still battling with her UTI. Daniel stated that they went to Canton on Tuesday and got stranded up there till about 3 p.m. yesterday. Car broke down on us and had to wait on a part to be delivered to be store, part store yesterday around noon, as I know my lawyer was telling you about it. Daniel asked why did the hearing get moved to the 18th. Haven't got to speak to my lawyer a lot yet. Let me know when you got those messages. You are still coming out next Tuesday, I assume. Send text on the phone if you need to contact me or Jessica from now on. We will let you know when we have minutes. All right. So on April 4th, um, you received this text. Uh, there's no phone conversation between the two of you, correct? Correct. It's simply a text and basically saying, we've had some bad luck. We went up to Canton. Bad luck happened. Um, we'll get back with you. Is that a fair statement? Yes. Um, there's additional... We don't need to go through that, but was he also asking uh, via text about um, maybe getting some gas vouchers and things of that nature? Yes. Uh, he also indicated, uh, maybe I misspoke earlier, um, uh, he, there was an uncle up north that was going to get him a dinner to go out for their anniversary. Yes. And so um, he was asking to reschedule something at that point because of that free dinner. Yes. Right? What was he asking to reschedule? To reschedule the home visit that I had scheduled for April the 9th. Okay. And um, were you accommodating? Yes. Were there attempts um, during this period, uh, after this period, uh, to contact Daniel and Jessica? I tried on 4-17 uh, to inform him that the GAL was coming out to his house between 4-30 and 5 o'clock that day. Okay. What's a GAL? Guardian ad litem. All right. Is that somebody involved in the custody case? Yes. All right. Um, is, there, is it their job to... Um, Look at the home, uh, evaluate whether it's uh, in the best interest for the child to be placed back with the parents on custody issues, that kind of thing? Yes. Okay. So that person was trying to get a hold of um, the Groves as well? Yes. And uh, were you informing them of the next home visit as well via text that would take place on April 24th? Yes. At this point in time, uh, are you making a number of texts or attempting a number of contacts with Daniel? I had four separate phone numbers that he was texting me from. Uh, were you trying all four of those numbers? All four of those numbers was being tried. And apparently the guardian ad litem was, to your knowledge, was the guardian ad litem trying those numbers as well? Yes. During this time, did Mr. Groves ever reach out to you or anyone to tell you that something was wrong with Dylan? No. During this time, your knowledge, did Mr. Groves reach out to anyone to tell them that there was something wrong with Dylan? No. To your knowledge, were there any calls to 911? No. Did you learn of some additional information on April 17th from Mahajan Therapeutics? Yes. What did you learn? Jessica had not been compliant. How long had she not been compliant? She had not had her individual therapist or any uh, compliant 
February the 8th was her last individual session and her last group attendance was March the 26th. Well, she's supposed to continue to have individual sessions during the period of February and March. Yes. So other than this one noted group attendance on March 26th, had she been compliant with Mahan? No, just the 26th. And if I recall, is that the date before the hearing? The date before the hearing. Again, nobody from the Groves family informed you of noncompliance? Correct, nobody informed me. There is, uh, when was the next court hearing supposed to take place? 418. Did that hearing take place? Yes. And uh, who attended that hearing? His attorney, her attorney, myself, and our attorney. Mr. and Mrs. Grove was not there. Did anyone try to contact Mr. and Mrs. Groves? Yes, we text messaged all numbers that we had. Any response? At that time? No. I'm going to hand you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 15. Shows the opposing counsel for the record. Document to be? An entry. From Sunday County Juvenile Court? Yes. Is that the dispositional entry of what happened on April 18th? Yes. Does that appear to be a true and accurate copy of the records of the Juvenile Court? Yes. To your knowledge, are all those records kept in the ordinary course of their business at Juvenile Court? Yes. And our official court records? Yes. In this entry, it's custody to remain with Society County Children's Services. Correct. As to Bill and Rose. Yes. Did you receive another contact from Daniel, Mr. Gross, being a senior <coughs> via text? Yes, on the 19th. <coughs> Prior to that text, were any attempts made to contact them? We'll refer on to page 44. We tried on the um, 18th, we text messaged him while we was in court. Okay. And then that, we didn't get no response. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the next day. What did you do then? I received a text on April the 19th um, stating he was still up north and that a friend is watching his home while he is away but I also made a home visit, an unannounced home visit with another caseworker was that, that morning. Was it, okay, so that was before this text. Yes. So you go out to the home um, with another caseworker. Yes. And uh, what do you do when you get to the home? We knocked on the door uh, several for several minutes. We looked around. I left a card in the door and in the mailbox for him to call me. <clears throat> Was anyone home to your knowledge? No. Um, then you received a, uh, there's a contact made to Rural King, correct? Yes. Um, um, was that before or after the, the text from Daniel? Before. Okay. Um, you contacted Rural King. Why did you contact Rural King? I wanted to verify he was working 
And maybe he went back to work is what I thought. Okay. Uh, what did they indicate as to his employment status? He had not been working there since uh, 2018. All right. Do you recall in, when, when in 2018 he quit working there? No. So you received this text that they're up north, friends watching the house. Does he say anything or represent to you anything about the health of Dylan? He said, Dylan is doing great, growing like a weed, LOL. I was going to contact you when I returned from this trip this weekend. My uncle, my uncle come down and picked us up because my car is broken down and can't really drive my truck from hitting a deer. My friend is going to drive my truck this weekend, some, some just, to, just like from his house to mine, which is only like eight miles away from my house, and he... Sometimes we'll be riding the four-wheeler back and forth as well, he told me. But I will contact you when I return home. It will probably be Monday night or Tuesday morning, whenever my uncle can bring us back. But I will definitely be in contact with you. Is court still set for May 18th? Just wondering, because that's what the last paperwork I received, it would be anyways. But wanted to let you know everything was okay with us, and sorry, haven't been in contact it's just been rough having no phone, and I hate to ask to use other people's phone. I, will I feel like I bother to, bother to them, LOL. Happy Easter to you and your family. Talk to you next week. We've already contacted you from four different numbers, right? Yes. Um, once again, this uncle's coming down to pick him up? Yes. Uh, he mentioned May 18th as a court date. What was the court date supposed to be? April 18th. April 18th. He mentions that Daniel, or Dylan, I'm sorry, Dylan is growing like a weed. Yes. LOL. Did you have any concerns at this point, probably earlier, but did you have any concerns at this point about uh, how things were going? Yes. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, as a caseworker at Children's Services, uh, again, how long had you worked there? I worked there. I, before I got Dylan's case, I was there six months. Okay. In that six months, had you had a number of cases uh, uh, that you worked on? Yes. Is it sometimes common for people not to contact you? Not all the time. Not all the time? Okay. Um, did this case concern you more than, than those other cases? Yes. How so? Because I hadn't had contact for so long with him and where we was trying to get in touch with him. And so at this point in the thing, um, he's supposed to stay in contact with you. Yes. Uh, Mr. Groves is supposed to ensure the children are protected, correct? Yes. Mr. Groves assured you that Mrs. Groves would be taking going to drug treatment, correct? Yes. yes. That she wasn't in the house more than what you guys allowed. Correct. Um, he had represented to you that he was employed? Correct. So what was, uh, what was uh, the, the plan of Children's Services at this point with regard to Baby Dylan? I continued to try to make contact with them throughout from the 19th. I went on the 22nd, the 23rd, okay. the 24th. At this point, were there any thoughts to remove baby Dylan from their care? Yes. Okay. At this point, were there any thoughts with regard to Daniel Jr.? We had took custody of Daniel Jr. on the 24th. Okay. So um, let's back up a day. You said that you went to the home. Was that April 23rd? 
Yes. All right. What did you observe at the home? No one was home, so we left a note in the door and in the mailbox. Uh, the items on the porch was not the ones that was left on the porch Friday even, at evening when I was out there with the, sh uh, the sheriff. Um, no one answered the door. Um, there was a trailer parked in front of um, a camper. Uh, the attachment to the truck was off. Uh, truck was turned around differently. Bathroom window was up, down, down, I'm sorry. And the living room window was up. Motion detectors made the noise where in the past they never made the noise. Let's talk about that a minute. Um, you mentioned before there was uh, sometimes a chain or uh, uh, a wire across the, the uh, road to get to the home, the driveway? Yes. Okay. Um, were there also, did you notice motion detectors? Yes. Where were those located? As you're going into the driveway, it's almost to their uh, trailer. One's on this side and one's back here. All right. And... Um, they, to your knowledge, were those located there every time you'd visited? Yes, um, but they never made a sound. Okay, so this time they're making a sound. Yes. You indicated that there were items on the porch from the previous Friday. Yes. Um, what were those items again? They were some water jugs, uh, some shoes. They was uh, some sort of um, like a ladder up against the the wall of the trailer on the porch. Okay. And it was cleaned. It was cleaned? Yeah, it wasn't cleaned before. Okay. So somebody had been there. Yes. How long did you stay, to your knowledge, if you recall, how at that residence on 423? Five or ten minutes because we knocked and screamed and looked around. Look in the window? Yes. Count on doors? Yes. What did you do next? Then we went to the school to talk to Daniel Jr. And uh, just for clarification, this is on April 23rd? Yes. And was that um, a Tuesday, to your knowledge? Yes. So Daniel was in school at Northwest. You went and uh, spoke to him? Yes. What was his demeanor? Um, he was nervous talking to us. Uh, he calmed down a little bit later on. Um, we just asked how, about Dylan, and he stated he was fine. Uh, I also asked him about his mom staying at the house, and she, he said yes, and then said occasionally. I did uh, request to tell his dad that I needed to talk to him, ASAP. Did you ask him about anybody else in their family? I asked him about the uh, Daniel's um, senior's dad, which would be Daniel oh. Jr.'s granddad. What did he say? Who was that? Uh, was it your understanding that um, Daniel Sr.'s dad was the one in Canton? Yes. And so when you asked about Daniel Jr.'s grandfather... He had know, no clue who I was talking about. Was there any change in plans regarding Daniel Jr. at this point? Not at this time. What was the next action by Children's Services? We went back to the office and then on Skip ahead to page 50 of 89. 
I received a text on the 23rd, received a text saying they both, if you can find them, which that was where we had staff with my, our supervisor about taking both Daniel and Jessica, if we could find them. All right, that's page 51 of 89. Okay. So at that point, Children's Services has decided we're going to get physical as well as legal custody of both? Yes. All right. Um, how did you obtain custody or physical custody of Daniel Jr.? I went out on the, um, on the day and I had called the school and told them not to let Daniel leave the school, that I would be out there to pick him up. And did you do so? Yes. And were you able to find a, an appropriate placement for Daniel Jr. at that point? Yes. Who? He's with his aunt and uncle. Okay. Um, was there an evaluation on their home? Yes. Safety audit? Yes. Drug screen? Yes. Um, background check? Background check? Yes. Okay. When you were there, did they receive a text from Daniel Grove Sr.? Yes. Did you have the opportunity to review that text? Yes. What was that text about? They wanted to know why Daniel didn't get off the school bus. So at that point, it's still April 23rd, correct? Correct. 24th. 24th, I'm sorry. So at that point on April 24th, you guys act to remove Daniel Jr. from the home so he doesn't get off the school bus. And while you're still at that home getting him settled, they receive a text saying Daniel didn't get off the school bus. Correct. From Daniel Grove Sr. Yes. Did you receive a text from Daniel Sr.? Later on that evening, I did. What was it about? He texted me asking why I took Daniel. Daniel stated that, I, I mean, come on, do you know what you're doing to him? This will affect his schoolwork. His whole life, he will, life will be. I can't believe you took him. He never had nothing to do with any of the situation at all, and this is hurting him more than anything or anyone. Where is he anyway? So at this point, via the text, um, Mr. Groves is expressing concern. I mean, there's some that uh, you guys removed Daniel from. Yes. Matter of fact, in the record, it, you have a lot of question marks after some of his questions, like multiple question marks and an exclamation point. Yes. Is that correct? So he's concerned at that point about what Children's Services is doing with Daniel Jr. Yes. What was Children's Services' next step? What was your next step with regard uh, to this case? Oh, wait a minute. Let me back up. Do you receive any... Um, did you attempt any more visits at the residence? On April the 30th, the day, I'm sorry, April the 24th, the day that I received the text from Daniel on why I took Daniel when I was placing him, I left the placement and went directly to the home. Why, why did you do that then? Pardon me? Why did you decide to do that then? Uh, because he had asked, wanted to know how Daniel wasn't there, so I thought, well, then they're home, so I went out there. Okay. Uh, was anyone there when you got there? No. Did you knock on the door? I knocked. I screamed. I even jumped up and down to try to see if there was anybody in the house. The dogs was barking. The windows was opposite this time. The living room window was down, and the bathroom was up. 
Any cars or vehicles? Both cars was there. All right. The, um, the but, truck and the car and then the four-wheeler was there. What was your understanding of the car that they got around in? The, the red Cavalier. I okay. believe it's a Cavalier. And was it oh, there? Yes, it was there. Okay. During this time period, and if you could talk in general, um, were there texts forwarded to you or um, directed to you that were from Daniel? Yes. Uh, what was the nature of those texts? Uh, there was one on um, 426 that stated, well, the person that was supposed to give him a ride to court this morning just screwed them over and okay. said... They so they, another excuse. Correct. Um, uh, was there another text later? Back and forth. Okay. More excuses. More excuses. Um, what, what action was taken by, uh, well, was there a representation made by Daniel Sr. to you that he would be returning baby Dylan? Yes. What was the date of that representation? There was one um, text that I had sent Daniel that he needed to have Daniel Dylan and Daniel Jr. stuff at the agency on 425. And then once again, I received a text at 7.52 a.m. stating that he would bring Dylan to our agency the first thing Tuesday morning. Okay, what page are you on for that, ma'am? 55 of 89. Thank you. Did Mr. Groves bring baby Dylan in that morning? No. After they failed to show what happened next, did the agency file any kind of report? On the 30th, I filed a missing person report. Who did you file that report with? Scioto County Sheriff's Department. At this time, did you also receive information from Christ Care Pediatrics? I received information from them on May the 1st. I received an email stating that they was trying to get in touch with me. Um, to your knowledge, had Christ Care been attempting to contact the parents as well? Yes. And were they successful in contacting the parents? No. Um, was there a medical concern, well, at least at that time, were you under the impression that there was a medical concern regarding Dylan um, from Christ Care Pediatrics? Yes, the um, nurse from Christ Care called and informed that they would, needed to repeat some lab work on Dylan back in February that his parents had not completed. Dylan had an abnormal newborn screaming, screening, and if it's not treated, it could cause brain damage. She faxed all the paperwork to caseworker, and she uh, said that he also had an appointment on May the 2nd, also at 2 p.m. All right. Now, did that turn out that that was a, um, actually a lack of communication between the doctors, that there, were, there was the subsequent test and he was normal? Yes. Okay. But at that point in time, that, did that add to your concerns? Yes. All right. If you would, could you, ref could you go to the second paper clip? It should be page 1 of 53 of the activity log. 
Are you there? Yes. Okay. So at this time, um, what was the agency doing to try to get baby Dylan back? We was trying, uh, I was text messaging him. I was um, trying to get a court order for the sheriff to help. Um, we also did an, um, tried to get an Amber Alert. Okay. Um, how many texts were you sending? I text him on every phone number that I had for him. Did you make any attempts to uh, follow up with uh, any relatives up north? Yes. Did you have any luck with that? No. What did you do to try to find them? I Googled the Grove's name and Canton, Ohio. So I took each name and dialed every phone number. A lot of the numbers was disconnected, but the people that I did talk to didn't know who I was talking about. So you, every Grove's listed under Google in Canton, Ohio, you made an attempt to call? Yes. The numbers that Daniel had given you earlier that you called him on, was he by responding to those? No. Um, had Daniel ever given you a number of any of his relatives up north? No. Had Daniel ever given you a name of any of his relatives up north? No. You had mentioned an Amber Alert. back up a moment um, on May 3rd was there another attempt to locate the family at the residence on page yes three of 53 yes okay who all went there that time myself another caseworker and a deputy sheriff okay any luck no uh, what cars were there there was no red Cavalier in the driveway, but the truck was there. The camper was there. There was another white vehicle there with the doors open. I'm going to direct your attention to uh, May of 2019 of um, various attempts. Uh, the Children's Services made to locate Baby Dylan. Um, uh, was there an attempt uh, made on May 7th at the residence to locate uh, the Groves family? Yes. <coughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you? Yes. Okay. Um, was that the one where uh, another caseworker, um, Megan Hankins, uh, went out? Yes. Okay. Um, at that point, was the car there? Yes. As well as the full-size pickup truck, Dodge. Okay, all the vehicles that you knew they may have utilized. Yes. Okay. Uh, was there another attempt on uh, May 15th by Children's Services at the residence? And that would be uh, page 16 of 53. Yes. Uh, and um, these attempts are, are, are children's services staff uh, kind of doing the same MO. They're leaving notes. They're knocking on the doors. They're... They're looking to see if, if, if there's movement or lights or anything of that nature? Yes. Okay. And on May 15th, the Cavalier was gone, is that correct? Cavalier was gone, but the red truck was still parked in the same spot. Okay. Appeared to be unmoved. Then again, on May 23rd, uh, which would be... Page 20 of 53. Oh, was there another attempt at the residence? There was another attempt to the, of the vehicle. 
I'm sorry, another attempt to the home, she parked at the end of the driveway and walked the driveway. Okay. Uh, in an effort, an effort at stealth? There was a red car, uh, the red Cavalier was there. Okay, but the, what was the purpose for parking at the end of the driveway? The road. Okay. Road conditions versus just trying to... Correct. Okay. Well, May 31st, was there another attempt at a home visit? It'll be yes. page 23. Okay. Um, no red Cavalier? Truck no, in the same spot? No red Cavalier in the driveway, and the Dodge, uh, the red Dodge pickup truck appeared to not have been moved. And on June 7th, was there another attempt at a home visit? Yes. Now, during this time in May, were you also contacting different entities to see if there had been any contact with the Groves family? Yes, we called uh, CareSource. Well, let me let's say numerous government entities. Yes. Attorneys. Yes. Family members. Yes. Daniel Jr. Yes. Um, was it your understanding that juvenile court personnel was also out looking for uh, the Groves? Yes. Uh, was it your understanding that um, at different times uh, the sheriff office was also out looking for the groves? Yes. Ultimately, on June 10th, were the groves uh, uh, apprehended by law enforcement? Yes. Were you aware of an allegation that when questioned, um, there was indication that uh, Dylan was taken by Children's Services months ago? Yes, I received a call at 9.21 p.m. Um, stating that they have arrested Daniel and Jessica Groves and that they informed me that Jessica and Daniel was telling them that I came several months ago and took the child. Did Children's Services take the child no, the last day I seen Dylan alive was March the 28th. And then you learned on June 12th when Dylan's body was found. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Refer further questions, John. Thank Good morning, Mrs. Kraft. We're going to, um, prosecutor went through quite a few things with you, and we're going to sort of start all over, start back quite a bit. Um, when you mentioned your, uh, how long had you been with the agency? I think you mentioned that earlier. I was hired in June of 2018. So, okay. Um, and you mentioned, where did you work before that? Shawnee Family Health Center. Shawnee Family Health Center, which is? A mental health facility and a um, physician's office. Okay, what did you do there? As a caseworker. Okay, same type of work? Just with adults. Just with adults, okay. Where did you work before that? I worked for rest care. Okay, did you have any sort of casework experience before that? Just with my... Um, 
internship that I had for my degree. Oh, okay. okay. So when you came over to Children's Services, uh, was there any training involved? We do core training. You do what? I'm sorry? Core training. Core training? It's eight trainings that we have to go to throughout the first year. Okay. Are those somewhere that you go to? It's or? Athens. Athens? Yes. Okay. Are they a week long, day long? How long are they? Some of them's two days. Some of them's one day. It just depends on what the core training is for that week okay. or that month. And you have done, you said eight of them? Eight of them. Okay. When you got involved in this case, had you did, have you done all your training? Not all eight. Not all eight. How many have you done? I had done six at that time. I'm sorry? Six, six? at that time. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so is it fair to say that if you not completed your core training, that you're still working as a caseworker and responsible for high-profile cases? We're still involved in cases. Okay, all right. You weren't working as, in, you didn't have a, there was, you're the only caseworker on this case, right? Yes. Okay, all right. In so January, starting in January the 25th. Okay, so I'm trying to get at, you were the only caseworker on this case, but you had not completed your training. Correct. Okay. Um, in that training, are you taught or Gave, given examples of how to write a report, how to put information into this activity log? Yes. Okay. Are you told what to specifically put into this activity log? The safety, oh. the, the, the surroundings, if the baby's clean, if we view any marks, anything like that. Okay. Is it general or is it specific as to what to put in the activity log? Well, the training. Oh, at the training? Yeah. Oh, it's specific. It, it depends on the child and the surroundings, what we put in there. But the safety we check, the housing, the baby if they're cleaning, uh, just safety needs and basic needs. Okay. What I'm getting at is that core training, do they tell you to be specific or do they give you certain wordage that you need to put in there? We need to be detailed. Detailed. Do they look for specific words? Do they say at training you need to put these specific words in it? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Okay, thank you. You did three home visits, correct? Yes. Uh, well, I mean, you made many attempts. Attempts, but I had seen the child three times. Three times. On February 4th? Yes. On February 25th? Yes. And on March 28th? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> I would like you to read these activity logs. You don't have to go through some of the case category or location type or any of that information. I want you to read the date, who created the activity log, and I want you to read the narrative. And let's start with uh, February 4th. Oh, I'm sorry. That's... Uh, I got that as page 24 of 46. You need to take this down. It's Okay. Could you, activity date, created by, and then the narrative. It was created on February the 4th okay. by Patricia Kraft. Okay. And it states, caseworker completed seven-day home visit with Dylan and Daniel. Kate, Jessica and Daniel both were there when the caseworker was visiting. Daniel is doing good. Dylan is doing good, I'm sorry. Okay. Daniel came in from school when caseworker was there. Daniel stated that things was going good. Jessica stated that Mahajan has her on a low risk. Jessica also stated about drug court. At that time, she is no, going... Let me, let me stop you right there. I think you're ad-libbing a little bit 
And I, I would like for you to read it word for word. Jessica stated that Mahajan has her on low risk. Jessica also stated about no, drug no, court. No, that's not. Asked yeah. about drug court. Yes, let's. Jessica also asked about drug court. At this time, she is going to Mahajan's twice a week and gets drug screen twice a week. She goes through groups the same no, time. No. She goes. She has groups the same time no. as drug court. So caseworker advised her to go to Mahajan until further notice. If, let me just stop. Your, your Honor, I, I would like you to instruct the witness to read it verbatim. Your Honor, oh my. Briefly. Want to call the bench? Uh, no, uh, ma'am, read it to the best of your ability. The document speaks for itself. Uh, if you wanted to read it, that's fine. If you don't like how she read it, Mr. Stratton, you can have the jury review it if it's submitted as evidence. Yes, Your Honor. Please continue, Mrs. Stratton. <clears throat> so, caseworker advised her to go to Mahajan until further notice. Jessica and Daniel asked about the immunization card, crib card, from Dylan's discharge paper. Caseworker will locate them, for, locate them for them. Dylan has a crib, a swing, and all necessary things. Dylan has a doctor's appointment on Thursday. Dylan and Daniel's basic needs are being met by the parents. Dylan and Daniel appeared clean and appropriately dressed. No placement <clears throat> concerns were reported. No medical concerns were reported. Interaction between the parents and children appeared positive and supportive. No physical hazards were viewed in or around the home at the time of visit. There is no safety plan in effect currently. While assessing the child's safety, well-being, and the appropriateness of placement, caseworker determined vulnerability for C. A N is low. There is no status change reported for the parents. Um, for the jury's, um, for the jury, could you explain what C A N is? Child abuse and neglect. Okay. And again, that says low, correct? Correct. Okay. <clears throat> I am going to show you what is defense exhibits A one through H one. Could you tell me what those are photos of? The home, the living room, the bedroom, Dylan's um, playpen, another playpen. Another playpen, a playpen, and playpen. A one through H one. Home of the groves. Yes. Okay. And these are the windows that you mentioned before that you looked in, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, you look in all of them? No. Okay. Did you look in these windows? I looked in the one beside the door. Well, oh, beside the door. Okay. Yeah. You said you had to jump. Yeah. See that. So uh, D one. You said you looked in the home, you visit, you've done three home visits. Did you go throughout the house, look in the rooms, make sure there were a bed, food, it was clean? Daniel was putting the crib together. He had it to be put together when the first visit I was there. Okay. Is this the crib you're talking about? No. Okay. All right. So have you ever seen this crib before? In the No. Not that one. Not that one. What is that a picture of? Of a bed. C1? 
is used. Do you know what this is a picture of? So, but you said you went to every room. No, I didn't go to every room. You didn't go. Mm-mm. Yeah. You didn't go to every room. You didn't check out the house. I don't. Uh, the only reason, the only time I do a safety check is a safety audit, is if we remove a child ourselves and have to put them in there. Usually, the investigator does the safety audit of the home. Okay. So, on these other exhibits, you mentioned again, you don't know what this is. You have never seen this. Critic. Never seen that one. Yeah. You see that? Same picture, same crib. Which is that huh? Oh, E1, you're on it. Oh, and over there. And then a couple other pictures of the crib that you have not seen. <coughs> G1, there you are. And then a picture of closer to the crib that you claim you have not seen. Correct? <coughs> Correct. Let's go to the second home visit, and that is the one on 225. And I'd like to, to read that activity today created by and narrative also. It's created by Patricia Kraft. Right. Caseworker completed ongoing monthly visit. Dylan appeared clean and appropriately dressed. No placement concerns, no medical concerns were reported. The child's basic needs are being met by parents. No physical hazards were viewed in or around the home at the time of visit. Supervision and discipline appear age appropriate. The parents ensure that all scheduled appointments are kept. Interaction between the parents and the child are positive and supportive. While assessing the child's safety, well-being, and the appropriateness of placement, caseworker determined that vulnerability for C, A, and N is low. There is no status changes reported for the family. Daniel stated that Dylan went to the doctor on Thursday. He weighs 8 pounds, 9 ounces, and is 22 inches long. Daniel stated the baby sleeps at 6 hours at a time. Dylan has own bed and, bed and bedding. Okay, so you viewed a crib, but just not this one. Not that one. Okay, all right. Also, like to you to read the uh, 328 home visit. Created by Patricia Kraft. Caseworker completed home, ongoing home visit. Dylan was taken in bottle when caseworker arrived. Dylan appeared clean and appropriately dressed. No medical issues were reported. No placement concerns were reported. The child's basic needs are being met by the parents. No state physical hazards were viewed in or around the home at the time of visit. Supervision and discipline appear age appropriate. The parents ensure all medical appointments are kept. Interaction between parents and children are positive and supportive. It was discussed if there was a possibility that Jessica could come back home. Jessica stated she is missing the bonding with Dylan. Caseworker informed the, both parents that caseworker would staff with Lisa Thomas and caseworker will call them later on to them today with an answer. Caseworker informed both they need to be at the hearing on April the 3rd, 2019. Caseworker staffed with Lisa Thomas about the possibility of Jessica going back home to bond with Dylan. It was agreed that a safety plan would be play, put in place and it would state that Jessica would attend all drug court days counseling. Mahajan for treatment, contact Caseworker Weekly up on dates. If Jessica has one positive drug screen or does not attend drug court, counseling both individual and group, this is a possibility both children will be removed. So is your supervisor telling you that Jessica can come back home? If there's a safety plan put in. Was there a safety plan put in? They never called me back. Okay. 
I had text. I had text them to yeah, call that's me. Fine. That's fine. That's great. <clears throat> Let me step back for a moment. Um, how many cases do you handle at this time, if you know, or now? How many cases are you handling as a case worker for Children's Services? Thirty-one. Thirty-one. Okay. Was it at that time or now? Now. Okay. What was it at that time? About twenty-three. About twenty-three. Okay. Okay. With twenty-three cases. You were able to remember every detail about these cases, like what he was wearing on each visit. You were able to remember that from your memory? Yes. Okay. On the 2-4 visit, you said he was wearing a long sleeve sleeper. Mm-hmm. No hat? No. Oh. And that Jess was holding him, Jessica correct? was holding him. Okay. But you did not hold him. No. You did not pick him up. No. Isn't it true that you merely glanced at him? I, I looked at him from up, sitting on the couch. From sitting on the couch? Yes. I'm right here and Jessica was right here. So you came in the house, sat down on the couch, didn't view Dylan at all, and the only time you looked at him was from the couch? When I seen Jessica with Jessica. Okay. So you didn't even go over to him and look and take a look at him? No. Okay. And let me clarify this. Daniel Jr. said everything was okay at the house on the 2-4 yes. visit. Okay. But again, on the 2-4 visit, you didn't go in every room in the house. No. He came in, talked to me for a few minutes, and went to his bedroom. Okay. So in these notes... You said there's no physical hazards, but you really didn't look at the entire property or the entire house to see if there were any physical ha hazards, did you? We, we look when we come in around the house. You didn't even look in the house. Not in every room. Okay. On the 225 visit, you said that Dylan was wearing a long sleeve sleeper, correct? Yes. Okay. Again on that visit, did you just come in and sit on the couch? Yes. Okay. And we talked. And you talked? Mm-hmm. Okay. And did you observe Dylan from your seat on the couch? Before I stood, sat down, I looked at him from head okay. to toe. All right. From head to toe. So you picked him up, held him? No, I didn't hold him. Okay. All right. So you sort of just glanced at him, didn't you? I looked at him. Okay. At the 328 home visit, you didn't ask Daniel why he wasn't at court, did you? We texted him the day before. Okay, but your earlier I testimony was you did not ask him at that home visit, did you? No, I did not ask him at that home visit. Okay. And Dylan, at that visit, was in a long sleeve sleeper. Yes. Okay. Again, did you just walk in and have a seat on the couch? At first, but before I left, I got up, walked over, looked at him. I made three statement, uh, two statements. I made, I wonder if he's going to have natural curly hair like his dad and brother. He has the prettiest blue eyes for a baby. And I touched the bottom of his foot and he grinned. Patricia Kraft, you know that's not a true statement, that you did none of that, yes, that you know. merely glanced at Dylan and did not actually observe him, did you? I think it's curious that you make the statement that you heard him make no sounds, no crying noises or anything, did you? Not while I was visiting. Okay. You mentioned that he was taking a bottle when you got there mm -hmm. and that at some point he stopped. She was burping him. 
She was burping him? Okay. Mrs. Kraft, do you think you did your job to the best of your ability? Yes, I did it within the law. The only thing I didn't do was bust the door down to find that baby. One second, Your Honor. Mrs. Kraft, I would like you to read case note dated 5-2, and it begins with caseworker staff with Supervisor Lisa Thomas. Page 38 of 46, but the page numbers are different. Uh, objections overruled. That's my continue with request. Mrs. Kraft, do you, did you find that 5 2 note? Were you staffed with Supervisor Lisa Thomas? Yes. Okay. Again, activity date created by, and I want you to read the narrative. The activity date was 5 2 19. It was created by me, myself. <laughs> It stated, caseworker staff with Supervisor Lisa Thomas about Daniel not showing up to court. Caseworker asked Supervisor about an Amber Alert and Supervisor informed to go to the staff attorney, Dave Huddleston. Caseworker staff with Dave and he informed it would be a Supervisor or a Director Fuller decision. Caseworker went back into the Supervisor's office and informed her what the attorney said and Supervisor stated that if an Amber Alert goes out, it would give a bad reputation for the agency because we lost a child. And you think you did your job to your best absolute ability, correct? Yes. But your supervisor just said this. Did you report this to anybody? Yes. Who did you report it to? I went downstairs and I was crying talking to another uh, supervisor and she was going to call Dr. Fuller. Okay, but did you report it to Dr. Fuller yourself? Dr. Fuller was not there at okay. that time. Did you report it to Dr. Fuller the next time you saw Dr. Fuller? We discussed it. You discussed it? Yeah. Again, what was the results of that discussion? On May the 3rd, I got a, me and a caseworker was out at lunch. The other caseworker got a text and told us to go to the sheriff's office and put out an Amber Alert. Okay. No further questions, Your Honor. Mr. Stratton, Ms. Scott, and we'll cross examine the witness. Thank you, Your Good morning, Ms. Craft. When 
The father was drug screened at the hospital on January the 11th of 2019. Were you present? No. Okay. That was conducted by investigator Johnson. Is that yes. correct? Is there an actual note in the activity log that explains the protocol in which she conducted that drug screen? There's a law created on January the 11th stating that caseworker Lauren Johnson met with Daniel in order for him to drug screen for caseworker. Daniel tested negative for all substance, therefore caseworker Johnson continued with the safety plan. Do you know if Mr. Groves would have been aware at that time that he was going to be drug screened at that particular time? No. Okay. That is not documented by investigator or caseworker Johnson, correct? Correct. Okay. Have you conducted a drug screen yourself um, at a place outside of the agency? No. Do you know if there is a separate protocol in regards to conducting a drug screen outside the agency? If they are doing a removal and it's going to kinship, they usually do it at the home of where the child or children are going to be placed at. Okay. Well, that was not the situation in this case, correct? correct. This was going to be conducted on the premises of, I believe, Southern Ohio Medical Center, correct? Lauren's... I do not know where Lauren had tested her, tested Mr. Dane, uh, Groves at. It is not documented? Mm -mm. No, it just said he, she had contacted him. Okay. Um, so there's no specific documentation other than it was a negative drug screen? Correct. There's nothing to indicate that she violated any of the protocol? Correct. There is nothing to indicate that someone else was present with him in the restroom at the time he gave a urine sample? Correct. There is no indication that that was conducted improperly? Correct. Do you carry your own drug screen kits on you when you anticipate drug screening someone outside of the agency? Yes. And are those drug screens temperature sensitive? Yes. And would that have been the type of drug screen that um, Lauren Johnson would have given um, Mr. Gross? Yes. Okay, um, so in order for it to be properly read as a negative drug screen, it would have had to have the appropriate body temperature reflected on the test, correct? Correct. Okay, um, nothing to indicate otherwise because it is listed as a negative drug screen, correct? Correct. Okay, thank you. Have you ever known since working with um, investigator caseworker uh, Johnson that she would conduct drug screens outside of the protocol of the agency? Could you rephrase that again? Yeah. Do you, do you know if she has ever violated policy when conducting drug screens or are you all trained on how to do that and you do it the same way each and every time? I have no information on her. Okay. She misled the protocol. Okay. So you would have no reason to have any other knowledge otherwise that she conducted this properly. Right. I do okay, know. thank you. And that's the way it was documented in the activity log is it was a completely negative drug screen. Correct. Thank you. It was also um, part of your testimony yesterday, I believe, that there is also documentation by, is it easier to refer to her by investigator or caseworker Johnson? Is, is she e both? Either one. Okay. Either one is fine. She's both. Correct. Yes. She holds both of those titles? Yes. Okay. Just so I don't have to say both, just for efficiency's sake. Um, caseworker Johnson also noted that um, Mr. Gross explained to her that he was unaware of 
Jessica Groves drug usage until essentially she was ready to give birth, correct? Correct. Okay. In this incident, you also made a referral to Help Me Grow. Correct. Um, was that a mandated program that they had to participate in? When a child is in our custody, they have to follow their recommendations. Okay. So if Help Me Grow said that Dylan needed to be in their program, then they would have to follow through with that program. Right. But there was no such recommendation made because there was no finalization of any of the reports. They was a, right. There's no recommendation because they had no contact with them. Okay. Thank you. When when was the drug screen made of Daniel Groves at the agency prior to Dylan being placed in his care? Do you have that exact date? Was that on January 28th or the Friday before that? The Friday before that. Okay. Is that? The 25th, I believe. Okay. January 25th. Did Mr. Groves know he was coming in for a drug screen? No. So that was a surprise yes. upon his arrival? Yes. Um, are you sure you are the one that actually conducted that drug screen, or was it Supervisor Thomas that by chance conducted that drug screen? I conducted that drug screen. Okay. So it was an unannounced drug screen, correct? Yes. Um, so he would have no knowledge of making preparation for that. Objection, speculation. Okay. I'll rephrase my question, Your Honor. Thank you. Um, there was absolutely no conversation about him taking a drug screen at the agency prior to that, him being requested to do that when he arrived, correct? Correct. Okay, thank you. And the protocol that you discussed earlier in your testimony is that the protocol you would have followed when conducting this drug screen Correct. That is correct. I what I done was he came in the office. I gave him the cup. He showed him where the restroom was. I stood out behind the door, told him do not flush the toilet or run the water. Okay. And also, once again, was there a temperature gauge on that sample cup? Yes. Did it match the appropriate body temperature that it should have shown for an appropriate sample being yes. retrieved? And once again, it was a negative drug screen. Correct. correct. Okay, so on January the 10th, or January the 11th, I'm sorry, there was a negative drug screen by Mr. Groves. Correct. There was also one on January the 25th. Correct. Of Mr. Groves, correct? Correct. And did, are you aware, um, I'm sorry, strike that, Your Honor. Um, was Mr. Groves also required to go to Mahajan Therapeutics for an intake, um, as well as Jessica Groves? I was unaware if he was referred through the investigator. Okay. So do she you, would have set that up. Okay. Um, I was just wondering if you were of any other drug screens that would have occurred between January 11th, or I'm sorry, January, yeah, January the 11th and January 25th. I'm unaware of that. Okay. As part of your um, agency's um, discussion regarding placing the child with the parent, and in this case, Mr. Groves, um, some of the things that you would have ascertained was whether or not they had previous involvement with the agency, correct? Correct. Um, and that was a negative that was in a this negative. situation, um, and that there was no violent background. Correct. Correct. And that was a negative in this situation. Yes. Correct. 
and that um, Mr. Grove had at least two agency conducted drug screens, correct? Correct. And both of those were negative? Yes. And they were approximately two weeks apart, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, so all of those things cleared him for placement of the child on January the 28th? Correct. Okay. Um, he cooperated with you acquiring all of that information? Correct. Um, he gave you any um, releases, appropriate uh, information to look up those things, um, look up those items? He was um, instructed to sign all releases. Okay. So he cooperated in that regard, correct? Correct. He um, allowed you to look into his life? Correct. Look into his background? Correct. Look into whether or not he had prior cases? Correct. Look into whether or not he had a criminal record or a violent criminal record? Correct. correct. Okay. And all of those came back as a negative? Correct. Including the two drug screens? Including the two drug screens. Great. Okay. And you, I believe, stated in your testimony um, that Investigator Johnson would have been the one that had already gone out and cleared the home? Correct. Do you know if there is an activity log or a note as to that? I did not see one okay. that she went out there. But that would have been the agency's protocol? Yes. And um, there would not have been the suggestion um, or the recommendation that the child be placed in him in his care if his home was not qualified? Correct. Okay. So we can make an assumption that she, since she made that recommendation to her supervisor, that his home must have qualified. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, when you made your personal visits there at the home, although you did not go through the entire residence, you did not have anything glaring or striking at you that there was anything appropriate about the home? Everything was fine from what I've seen. Okay, great. Um, the note um, that was placed into the activity log about Mrs. Groves being loopy on a visit, which was indicating an indication that she may have been under the influence of a substance, did not involve Mr. Groves, correct? Correct. Okay. There was no indication from the foster parent that she made that same observation about my client, Mr. Groves, correct? Correct. Okay. When you had interaction with him on that first do you call it a team meeting? Family team meeting? Team meeting. Yes. Okay, just making sure I got the correct wording. Did you observe anything about Mr. Groves that was inappropriate? No. Okay. Did you observe anything about him that would cause you concern when the recommendation was made that the child be placed with him that would have given you pause for calls? No. Thank you. And you did conduct a home visit on February the 4th, which was close to your seven-day home visit because there was some weather-related issues, correct? Correct. Okay. And everyone um, was present, and you saw them on that day because Daniel Jr. arrived at a later time, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, all appeared appropriate with the family? Yes. You did not note any exceptions? None at all. Um, you did not um, have concern to where you came back and staffed and said, hey, we need to take the child back out of the home at this time? Correct. Um, you did not note, um, I believe, in your activity log about what the child was actually wearing that day. That is testimony from personal memory, correct? Correct. And that's memory from a year ago, correct? Correct. Or approximately a year ago. We're not in February yet. Um, and I believe it's also your testimony that you did not actually touch baby Dylan 
Correct. Um, or manipulate him in any fashion. No. Um, and the baby was being held by Jessica Gross, correct? correct. Was she cradling him up front? Yeah, she was cradling him like this. Okay. Yeah. And so not the entire, there were not large portions of his body visible to you, correct? Correct. Um, and if she was cradling him to where his head would be resting against her arm, the back of his head would not be exposed, correct? Correct. Okay. Probably close to the forehead forward? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So whether he was wearing a hat or not, you did not see the majority of his head? Didn't see it. I did not see a hat on him. Okay. But whether he was wearing a hat or not, you did not see the majority of his head? Correct. Okay. You did not see the back portion of his head? No. And you probably did not see a very great portion from the mid top of the head backwards, correct? Correct. Because she would, the baby was resting in her arm. Correct. Okay, thank you. You did not see his arms exposed to you? Just his hands. His hands? Yeah. Okay. You did not see his chest exposed to you? That was, he was in a sleeper. Okay. I, it's not a trick question. No. <laughs> you did not see his legs exposed to you? No. Um, nowhere really other than his face. Face and his hands. Hands, maybe his ears, um, and a portion of his forehead area, correct? Correct. Okay, thank you. Did you conduct any uh, drug screens on the parents at their home that day? No. Did you conduct any type of drug screens on either one of the children that day? No. Okay. I believe in your direct testimony, and correct me, please correct me if I'm wrong, I thought you stated that the child did not make it to his doctor's appointment in, in early February. Um, can you please correct me if I'm wrong? I, I don't want to misspeak for you, but that is the note that I made, is that you stated that the baby missed his doctor's appointment, I believe would have been scheduled on February the 7th at Christ Care Pediatrics. And I don't know if that was a discussion that you had on February the 21st or if that was something that you was testifying from from memory. February 25th, the parents ensure that all scheduled appointments are kept. Okay. Okay. So if I heard you say that the baby didn't make it to his doctor's appointment around February the 7th, that may have been something I misheard. I don't have no written knowledge of him okay. at the doctor you, on the seventh. Okay. Do you know so you do not know if he actually had a doctor's appointment on February mm -hmm. the seventh and all was well? Not till um Christ Care had sent me all the paperwork. And then you were aware, aware that, that he, had he one did on, have yes. an appointment. Okay. So if I wrote that down, then I wrote that down incorrectly. Just to make for sure. <gasps> I just want to make sure that is not your testimony today, that he did not attend his doctor's appointment on February the 7th. The one on the 21st, they was ordered to take um, Dylan to the doctor, to the hospital for some lab work at that day. Okay. He also attended on February the 21st right. as well. But what about on February the 7th? Are you aware that I he was went? unaware until the 1st of May when the, I got the paperwork that he did have an appointment on the 1st. So you are acknowledging here today, sorry, didn't mean to cut you off. You're acknowledging here today that he attended a well child visit on February the 7th as well as on February the 21st, correct? Yes, but they did not take the test on the 7th. Okay, but he did attend that doctor's appointment.
Correct. Okay. Are you referring to some personal notes or a different set of notes? I'm just reading the, the, the thing that the doctor had faxed us. Okay. I just want to make sure yeah. what you were using for it's, the record yeah, to reflect your recollection. Care. Okay. Yeah, and it states that they made the appointment, okay. uh, first visit with us on February the 7th. Okay. That was his first visit. Okay. And that was a well child visit? Yes. And the baby appeared fine? Or does it? It doesn't say. It doesn't just, say that. Okay. Yeah. But there's nothing saying there was anything wrong. Correct. Nothing was reported to the agency that anything was wrong. Correct. And if the pediatrician had noted something being wrong with the child, um, they would have more than likely contacted the agency like they did later on in May? Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, you, ta you talked a little bit um, with Mr. Tiemann, I believe, um, in regards to how bad the phone reception and the telephone service was out at uh, the Mount Hope Road address in Otway, correct? Correct. And um, did the Groves have an actual old school landline? No. Did they rely on cell phones for communication? Yes. Did they have access to the internet if you were aware? I was not aware of that. Okay. So you do not know if their phone lines would have been enhanced by the use of the internet? Correct. Okay. And is it your testimony that you do know that they had sketchy or spotty cell phone service on uh, occasion? On occasion, and I actually had to use my cell phone out there. Um, on February the 4th when I went there, I tore my car completely up. So I was trying to get a hold of the towing company and I had to walk around trying to find service. So you personally have actual experience with having terrible phone Oops. reception out there. Correct. So you had to kind of walk and hold your hand up and yes. hold your leg up and your arm up and try to capture a signal, correct? Correct. So if you made multiple attempts to call them or text them, that's not unusual that either that may not have gone through or may not have been received because of the bad reception, correct? Mr. Grove says if he laid it in a certain part of the window where he would lay it, he would always get the messages. But you don't know if he always laid it I there or not. I do not know that. Okay. So it was not striking to you that there wasn't always an immediate return phone call, correct? correct? Okay. Thank you. Then again, on February the 25th, you did complete a separate home visit, correct? Correct. And that all appeared well? Yes. No concerns? No concerns at all. Um, once again, I believe that it was reported that all was going well, um, and nothing jumped out at you in regards to a need to remove the child at that time, correct? Correct. Okay. You did not report any injuries? Correct. Did not note any injuries? Correct. Um, what do you recall of where the child was at that time, who was holding him, who was not holding him? Jessica was always holding him when I'd go out there. Okay. So if Jessica was once again holding him, would she have been holding him in the cradling position as we discussed earlier? Correct, and then she put him on the sh her shoulder. Okay, and um, but do you know if that is what occurred when you were there on February the 25th? Other than her cradling, that was okay. the only thing that I seen her do. You only saw, mm -hmm. you only recall her actually cradling, cradling him yeah. in her arms, where he would be laying on his back, her his head resting in the crook of her arm, essentially. And she and she would kiss him. And she would, she would show affection mm -hmm. to him. Okay. Did Mr. Grove show an appropriate um, concern or affection for Dylan when you were there? Yeah, because every time I had asked a question, he would answer it. Okay. Um, he seemed appropriately concerned? Yes. Um, he gave appropriate responses? Yes. Um, did he appear as if he was under the influence of anything? No. Um, and once again, um, I believe that your testimony was is that he was wearing some type of garment that covered up most of his body. Correct. Um, 
not wearing a hat, no. but once again, not to beat a dead horse, but most of his head was not actually visible. Correct. correct? Um, once, similar to the same questions I asked you before, basically his hands, his face, and a little bit of his forehead was exposed to you visibly, correct? Correct. Okay. Midline from the back of his head, not exposed to you? Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, there was some issue made about him not, Mr. Groves not attending court um, on February the 27th of 2019 at juvenile court. It'd be March the 27th. I'm sorry, March the 27th. I apologize for misstating that month. Um, while um, at court, was there contact made with Mr. Groves um, either through court personnel or through his attorney? Yes. Okay. And so he was available through either a text message or a phone call during after, that period of after time? After a little bit. After he, it? Yeah, he finally returned. But he was, he was reached? Yes. Okay. And at that point in time, you scheduled your March 28th home visit? Correct. correct? Okay. Um, and as you stated before in your testimony, it's not unusual sometimes for folks not to show up for court in the court. Does the court make a big deal out of it if attorneys are able to reach their clients by phone as long as there's an agreement? As long as there's an agreement. Okay. And as long as there's not testimony that's actually going to be taken on the record, um, parents sometimes are able to agree with their uh, attorneys while they're on the phone? Correct. And that's what happened on that March 27th day? Correct. And so there was not really a big deal made out of it, correct? Correct. Okay. And that's not atypical for those proceedings in juvenile court? No. Okay. And once again, on March the 28th, for that visit, um, there were no notes of concern for you? Correct. Um, nothing appearing out of the ordinary? Nothing. Um, once again, you testified that, Ms. that the baby was wearing a sleeper? Correct. Um, once again, you noted in your testimony that Jessica Groves was holding the child? Feeding when I arrived. Oh, I'm sorry, feeding the child. And so was the child in, it wasn't old enough to sit in a high chair. Correct. Okay. So how was she feeding the child? Was she holding the child and, and giving him a bottle? Yes, holding the, child, holding the child and giving him the bottle. Okay. So once again, was she cradling him in her arms, had him in her lap, had him on a boppy pillow? What was going on? Cradling her, him. Cradling him. Mm -hmm. Once again, his head was resting in the crook of his arm. Her arm, I'm sorry. Correct. And the majority of his head would not have been exposed. Correct. Um, she was feeding him. Yes. Showing him appropriate attention at that time. Yes. Did Mr. Groves uh, answer your questions and respond to the conversation appropriately? Yes. Did he seem to have appropriate concern for his child? Yes. Okay. And although you were asked about whether or not there was an injury to his head, you did not see the entire portion of his head, correct? Correct. And that is true for all of the three home visits and face-to-face -face contacts you had with this child. You did not see the majority of the portion of his head. Correct. Thank you. Um, Then we get into a pattern and a practice of Mr. Groves and Mrs. Groves avoiding you. Correct. You never had face-to-face -face contact, really, with either one of them after that point, correct? Uh, correct. Okay. People that start avoiding the agency raises suspicions, correct? Correct. No one else that you talked to had ever seen the child again after March 28th, correct? correct. You talked to 
friends, families, neighbors, as many folks that you all can reach out to, correct? Correct. No one saw this child after March 28th, correct? Correct. Not that you were able to ever ascertain, correct? Correct. I know this is very upsetting for you, as well as it is for all of us. But we don't know what happened after March 28th, do we? No. They were avoiding you? Yes. They were avoiding their own family? Yes. They never really came forward to try to get Daniel Jr. back, did they? No. Other than the text message, hey, what's going on? That was it. Mr. Groves did exhibit concern about Daniel Jr.'s welfare and asked where he was at, correct? Correct. He did play somewhat of a game with you and kept telling you that he was going to produce the baby, correct? Correct. He never did, did he? No. Did you suspect at that time that the child was not alive? Yes. That would be the only reason why it wouldn't produce the child, correct? Correct. Did you notice or observe an unusual relationship between Jessica Groves and Daniel Groves when you were in their presence? No. Did you observe a loving relationship between the two of them? Yes, they was very supportive of each other. They were bonded to each other, correct? Correct. Would you say that's an accurate observation? Yes. They'd been together for a long time? From years. your understanding. Yeah. 20 plus years? Correct. Did you ever observe <coughs> while you were asking questions of maybe Mr. Groves that he would look to Mrs. Groves before he answered or gave you any answers? I, I never noticed. But at that time, everything was all okay, correct? Correct. Okay. And on the occasions, just to be clear, and I believe that you've already testified to this, you did not pick up or manipulate the baby in any form or fashion other than tickling his foot on that one occasion, correct? Correct. Okay. Your Honor, may I have a conversation with Mr. Trump? <laughs> Ms. Kraft, um, after that 328 day, you never had a face-to-face -face again with either one of the Groves, the parents, Jessica or Daniel. Correct. Um, you never saw Dylan again. Correct. You only saw Daniel Jr. Correct. And he also kind of fell out of contact with his parents as well, correct? Correct. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have this time. Scott, you agree we're at? No, Your Honor. Any other questions for this witness? No, Your Honor. No, Your Honor. Not at this time, Your Honor. Thank she, you. She excused. Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Yes, she would be excused for our purposes. And you're free to go. Ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, now 
time for our lunch recess. I'm going to ask. Probably notice the clock in the courtroom is a little slower than the one that's up there on the screen. The one on the screen, I believe, is a little more accurate. I'm going to ask that you be back in the jury room at 25 minutes after one. Uh, during the lunch recess, I'm going to conduct some other hearings on some other cases and would ask counsel to be back here at the same time. It would be my intention to be in the courtroom at 1.30 to start the afternoon session of testimony. Remember my earlier admonition to you, do not discuss this case amongst yourselves. Do not discuss it with anyone else. Do not permit anyone to discuss it with you or in your presence. It is your duty not to form or express an opinion on this case until it is finally submitted to you. At this time, I'll see you in about an hour. Please be seated. We're back for the afternoon session of testimony in State of Ohio versus Daniel Groves, State of Ohio versus Jessica Groves, case number 19 CR 586 A and B. Council and the parties and the jurors are present in the courtroom. Is the state ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. Is the defense ready to proceed? We are, Your Honor. Thank you. Yes, Your Honor. State may call their next witness. Your Honor, the state would call Dr. Muhammad Ali. Can you raise your right hand for me, please? Yes. Sir, do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Please have a seat. Sir, there is media in the courtroom. Do you have any objection if they uh, film or photograph your image during your testimony? No objection. You may proceed, Ms. Hutchinson. Thank you, Your Honor. Sir, if you wouldn't mind, introduce yourself to the jury and then spell your name for the record. Yeah, I'm uh, Dr. Mohammed Ali, uh, and it's a M O H A M M A D, and last name is Ali, A L I. Uh, I'm a, a pediatrician. Okay. And where are you currently working as a pediatrician? I work for a CAC of Pike County up in Waverly. Okay. Um, how long have you been a pediatrician? Uh, actually, 20 years now. 20 years. If you would explain to the members of the jury your educational background. Yeah, so I did my uh, medical school uh, from uh, Peshawar University in Pakistan, and then I uh, did my pediatric residency, um, University of Oklahoma, Tulsa. Okay. And what are your current licensures or uh, board certifications? Yeah, I'm a board-certified pediatrician, and I'm uh, licensed uh, in the state of Ohio. Okay. Um, and in your practice in Waverly, do you treat uh, pediatric patients on a day-to-day -day basis? Yes, I do. Okay. Uh, what is considered a pediatric patient? So a pediatric, uh, uh, from the time they're born to, till they almost um, you know, graduate from high school, it depends on what definition you look at. If you look at the American Academy of Pediatrics, uh, it's 21. Okay. So birth to 21? Yes. Okay. And you've been seeing children birth to 21 for 20 years? 20 years, yes. Okay. okay. Um, at this time, Your Honor, I'd ask that he be designated an expert in pediatric care. of his qualifications uh, as pediatrics. I would waive such questioning. We would stipulate his expertise as a pediatrician based on his, his years of practice and his education. Since his waive and stipulated, Dr. Ali is uh, being an expert in the field of pediatric, uh, pediatrics. It means, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, he is allowed to give opinion testimony in this field. May I continue, Your Honor? Continue. Thank you. Doctor, um, in the normal course of your business there at Valley View, do you maintain patient records? Uh, yes, we do. Okay. For each patient? For each patient. And each visit? Each visit. Okay. Let me hand you what's previously been marked as State's Exhibit 19 and ask you if you recognize these documents. The record of the flood Do you recognize those records? Yes, I do. Okay. And how do you recognize them? 
Uh, this is uh, when I'd seen uh, the infant in my office. Uh, I'd seen him there for a couple of times, different times, and this is one of the notes. Okay. Um, and when you say the infant, are you referring to infant Dylan Groves? Yes. Okay. Let me direct your attention to that time frame. It looks like you would have started seeing baby Dylan at the hospital. Is that right? Yes, I did. Uh, okay. So the first time I'd seen him was at the hospital after he was born. And then um, once he went home, I'd seen him a couple of times at my office. Okay. Um, were there any concerns for the baby at the time you saw him at the hospital? Yes. Medical uh, concerns? Uh, yes. Uh, so we had to keep the baby a little longer than usual. Normally we uh, keep the baby for a couple of days, uh, but Dylan had to stay there almost a week because he was uh, experiencing some uh, withdrawal symptoms. When you say withdrawal symptoms, what do you mean? What that means is sometimes babies, yeah, uh, when, they're, when the mom is pregnant, it depends on what medications they're taking or what drugs they're exposed to, and the baby gets exposed to the same. And then after the birth, uh, they, ex they can experience withdrawal symptoms. Okay. Would you explain to the members of the jury what types of symptoms you look for? So typically we look for uh, a lot of uh, sneezing, sometimes excessive diarrhea, tremors. The major symptom is tremors, shakiness. Um, and then uh, excessive uh, irritability, lack of appetite. So there's a long list of symptoms. Okay. Um, would a baby who's withdrawing from drugs experience pain? Um, that is uh, hard to say, but you know, if you've treated everything else, all the other symptoms, and the baby is still uh, irritable excessively, uh, then that could be one possibility. Okay. And you said you saw baby Dylan after his release from the hospital as well, is that right? That's right. Okay. Would that have been January 16th, his first visit with you? Correct. Okay. If you would, explain to the members of the jury what the reason for his appointment was. So basically, uh, once they go home, um, uh, the babies, normally we see them in a couple of days. That's a routine. Uh, but especially in a case like this, you know, uh, we want to make sure we see them because we want to make sure that uh, after they've been treated for their uh, withdrawal symptoms, you know, they're doing better and they're not reverting back to the symptoms. So with him, that was a major reason. And do you call these visits uh, well child checks or well newborn checks? Yes, uh, well newborn check. Okay. Yes. If you would generally describe for the jury what that involves, a well newborn check. So at this stage, uh, when we see a newborn, um, um, what it entails is we want to make sure they're uh, getting enough nutrition, uh, we keep track of their weight, uh, and then, you know, obviously uh, their um, output as far as urine. Um, and you know how how they in, in general how they're doing, their okay. well-being. Okay. Um, do you recall or could you refer to your records and tell the jury who accompanied the baby to his first appointment? Yeah. So the first time I uh, seen the baby was a uh, foster parent. Okay. Yeah. And were there any concerns voiced by the foster parent in regards to baby Dylan's health? Your Honor, these are medical diagnoses. Council approach for a moment. Listen, restate the question, please. Doctor, in your well visit with uh, baby Dylan and the foster mother on January 16th, did she express any concerns to you regarding his medical health? Yeah, a couple of things. Uh, she had mentioned that um, he had been sneezing um, excessively and that um, had seen a few tremors. Okay. Before we go any further, is it normal for a baby to sneeze? Yes, it's normal for a baby to sneeze, uh, but it's um, excessive sneezing, especially with such a background and a history, you know, that it means a little different. Okay, and then also with the tremors? With the tremors, yes. Okay. Well, the tremors are, you know, uh, very unusual in a healthy newborn. Uh, so at any point, you know, if there are tremors, you know, then we get concerned. Okay. If you would explain to the members of the jury, um, if you remember or by referring to the medical records, what baby Dylan's height and weight was at that visit on January 16th. Uh, yes, I can...
So yeah, he was uh, 19 inches tall and weighed five pounds and 5.5 ounces. Okay. If that were a little less than what he weighed at birth, would that be abnormal? Um, his birth weight was um, five pounds and 10 ounces. No, that's not unusual. Uh, so basically, um, by the time infants are two weeks old, if they weigh as much as the birth weight, then it's fine. They can lose up to five to 10% the first week or 10 days. Okay, why is that? A lot of times it's the retained fluid that they have in their body when they're inside mom, so they lose a lot of that fluid. And uh, you know, that, that's an important factor. Okay, and if you would explain to the members of the jury your general examination of baby Dylan, what that included and what you found. So yeah, the general exam, we do a basically head to toe exam. We check all the system, uh, you know, uh, head and neck, chest, heart, abdomen, skin, neurology, uh, all the different sy uh, symptoms. And basically that day, um, his exam, uh, there was nothing unusual about his exam when I seen him um, in the office at the time I'd seen him. Okay. At that specific time. No bruising to the baby? I did not see any bruising, no. Okay. Were you made aware of any injuries as a result of the actual delivery? Uh, not that I can recall. Okay. Um, and it looks like you examined extremities uh, and chest and back, uh, abdomen, no, nothing abnormal there either? No, nothing abnormal. Okay. And so other than, would it be fair to say that other than the withdrawal symptoms, he was doing well? He was doing well, yes. Okay. Um, and it looks like, let me direct your attention to January 23rd, 2019. Uh, did you have an occasion to see baby Dylan again in your office? Uh, yes, I did. Okay. And again, who was present for this appointment with the baby? Uh, the, a foster parent. Okay. And the foster parent that presented the baby for the appointment, did she express any concerns in regards to his health? Let me refresh my look at my notes here. Mom, yeah, the foster parent had mentioned that, you know, the baby had been excessively sweating, but did not report anything else like fever, rash, any illnesses, nothing else. Okay. Would the excessive sweating be related to withdrawal symptoms, or is that something unrelated? That's something unrelated. Okay. And if you would again tell the members of the jury what his height and weight was at that appointment. At that appointment, his height was 19.5 inches and weight was almost six pounds. Okay, so he's picking weight back up. <coughs> yes. All right. And so would it be a fair statement to say at that appointment the baby was doing well? Yes. Okay. Um, was there ever any concern about an abnormal newborn screen for baby Dylan? Yes, uh, the, so normally we do a newborn screening on all the babies. It's required by the state of Ohio. And um, at one point I was notified about an abnormal uh, screening. Okay, uh, and was this that, baby. I'm sorry. But there was a little miscommunication because then after this visit, I'd never seen the baby. They uh, transferred care to um, uh, Christ Care Pediatrics. Uh, and then they had notified us about the abnormal screening, and we had thought that we had repeated. Normally, when we get an abnormal screen, the routine is we repeat it. And most <coughs> of the times, the repeat ones come back normal. Uh, so for some reason, we thought we had repeated the screening, but we had actually not. Uh, there was a miscommunication. Okay. And was that the 17 hydroxy progesterone? Yes. Am I saying that right? You're saying that perfect. Okay. Would you explain to the jury what that is? That is a product. So on, on top of the kidneys, we have a small gland. It's called the adrenal gland. It makes that chemical. Um, and it, uh, uh, it regulates your blood pressure, your blood volume. Basically, it's, it's, it's a very critical um, uh, chemical as far as your, especially your blood pressure regulation. Okay. And so if the baby, in fact, had an abnormal 17-hydroxyprogesterone, uh, if that was actually an issue for the baby, um, it would cause blood pressure issues, It will cause say? excessive uh, hypertension, and it depends on, uh, you know, how, because when you see the abnormalities in, in that gland, the adrenal gland, um, it can be to the point where the baby's not even thriving, the baby's not gaining weight, 
or the baby refuses to eat, you know. Um, so those are some of the symptoms. Routinely, we don't check blood pressures on babies when they come to the office, unless there's a suspicion for something. Okay. So that's why you don't see the blood pressure and the vital signs. And was your office ever notified about whether or not a follow-up was done? We just had a, uh, we had some communication from Christ Care Pediatrics, and um, that's the last we heard about the screening. Okay, so you're not aware of whether or not they eliminated yes, that possibility? I, I, I'm, I'm not aware. Okay. Um, if he had <coughs> an issue with that, would that result in fractures to his bones? No. Would that result in bruising to his body? No. Would that result in swelling to his head? No. Okay, so Absolutely. it's not, a, not an issue like that? No. I have nothing further at this time. Thank you, Ms. Hutchinson. Uh, Scott, you may cross examine. Questions, questions, Ms. Scott, you may cross examine the witness. Thank you, Dr. Ali, um, when you had the exam with baby Dylan at the hospital, was that at SOMC Medical Correct. Southern High Medical Center? Yes. And was that at the same time? That, he, that was his initial birth before he was originally discharged. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Were the parents present for your initial examination of baby Dylan? The best that I can recall, uh, I, I think when I did my initial exam, because the routine is when we do an initial exam, we go talk to the parents. Uh, so from what I can recall, I, I think I remember talking to the mother. Uh, just to, you know, because routinely we discuss the newborn exam and then you know, if they have any concerns, questions, or they would like to dis discuss anything. Okay. But your only recollection at this time, and I know it's been almost a year ago, um, your only recollection is you may have had a conversation I'm, with the mom? I may have. Okay. You don't recall having a conversation or dad being present for that conversation? I, no, I do not recall that. But it doesn't mean he was not present? Uh, correct. You just don't have any independent recollection? That's correct. And then the two visits that you had in your office, those were the child was accompanied by his foster parent? That's correct. And neither parent was present during those office that visits? That's correct. Okay, is that unusual that just a foster parent brings in a child when a child is in foster care? versus a foster parent and or the parents? So that's a good question. A lot of times when we see these babies that are, because of the social situation, they get transferred to foster parents or relatives. A lot of times when they come see me in the office, just the foster parent is there. Sometimes, you know, you can have the relatives there. And, and then in cases I've seen the parents there too. Okay, yeah. but it's more typical that the foster parent Usually would be there the along with the parent. child. Yeah. Yes. Okay, yes. thank you very much. Appreciate yep. it, Dr. Ali. No problem. Any questions for this guy? No questions, thank you. Such as any redirect? No, Your Honor. Any other questions for this witness? Not on my behalf, Your Honor, thank you. Is he excused? Excused. Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Sir, thank you very much. You're free to go. Sorry, who's your next witness? Dr. Gregory Hudson. Dr. Hudson. Can you raise your right hand for me, please? So I swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Sir, please have a seat. Now, sir, we do have media in the courtroom this afternoon. Do you have any objection if you are your image is filmed or photographed during your testimony? No objection? Okay. No objection. Ms. Hutchinson, you may inquire. Thank you, Your Honor. Sir, if you wouldn't mind, introduce yourself to the jury and spell your last name for our record. Okay. I'm Greg Hudson. I am a, a pediatrician. My last name is spelled H-U-D-S-O-N. And Dr. Hudson, where are you employed as a pediatrician? At uh, Christ Care Pediatrics in South Shore, Kentucky. Okay. And how long have you been a pediatrician? 30 years. Okay. Um, if you would explain to the members of the jury what your educational background is. Yes. I went to uh, college at Murray State University and had a big degree in biology minor in chemistry, then went to the University of Louisville School of Medicine, followed by a pediatric residency at Louisville Affiliated Hospitals and Coast Air Children's Hospital, 
which is now Norton's Children's Hospital in Louisville, Kentucky. And what licensures or board certifications do you hold? I am uh, board certified uh, in pediatrics and have a license to practice medicine both in the state of Ohio and the state of Kentucky. Okay. Let me hand you what some of our state's exhibit 20 for record reflect when I showed that to the council. Do you recognize the document that I just handed you? Yes. Okay, and what is that? That is uh, my curriculum vitae. Okay, and is that a true and accurate representation of your educational background, your experience, your licenses? It is. Okay. For the record, doctor, what is considered a pediatric patient? Pediatric patient is a uh, patient anywhere from birth uh, up until uh, 18 years or sometimes even through college age uh, as far as the care that, that we give at our office. Okay, and so you've been treating children from birth to? Through college age. Some, college age uh -huh. for 30 years? 30 years. Okay. Your Honor, at this time I would ask that the court designate him as an expert in pediatric care. It is offered. Uh, Dr. Hudson is an expert in the field of pediatric care. Does either defense counsel wish to question him as to his extent of his qualifications? Your Honor, we would waive such questioning and we would stipulate to his designation as an expert in pediatric care. We'll waive the stipulation. Given the uh, stipulation, court will find Dr. Hudson is an expert in the field of pediatric care, which means, once again, for the ladies and gentlemen of the jury, he is allowed to give ex uh, expert opinions. Uh, in his field of practice. You may continue, Ms. Hutchins. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, doctor, before we move on to why we're here today, um, in your course of business over there at Christ Care, do you maintain patient records? Yes. Okay, and are those maintained on every patient for every visit? Yes. Okay, let me hand you what's going to be Martha State's Exhibit 21 for identification. Doctor, if you would take a look through State's Exhibit 21 and tell me if you recognize this Okay, and what patient records are you do you have there that you recognize? Uh, patient records of Dylan Groves. Okay, and is he um, given a patient number or some type of identification for the record? More than any more than his name, or is do you just chart them by name? Uh, I, I go by the name. I mean, I, I think we do have a, a number that we assign. But okay, all right. Um, would you say that's a true and accurate representation of the records provided by your office to our office? Yes. Okay. Let me direct your attention to February 2019. Did you have an opportunity to uh, treat baby Dylan Groves uh, as a pediatric patient? On February, yes, in February, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. What was the first date that you would have seen baby Dylan? Would that have been February 21st? Uh, February the 7th. February, okay, uh -huh. February the 7th. If you would explain to the members of the jury how you became involved in baby Dylan's care. If, pardon me, I'm sorry? If you would explain to the jury how you became involved in his care on February 7th. Okay. Uh, of course, the, the parents had, had scheduled an appointment. We had, we had called, I do believe, uh, because of an abnormal newborn screening that all, all infants uh, get a blood test done at, shortly after the time of birth to screen for certain metabolic or endocrine abnormalities, things like cystic fibrosis or congenital adrenal hyperplasia, things like this. And there's a series of t panel of tests, and one of his tests came back uh, abnormal. And so we contacted them because they had, 
they I think they had probably listed us as being the pediatricians in the hospital, so we contacted them about coming in for an appointment, I think is what happened. Okay. What was the reason you said that you think that he came in because of some contact your office had with him? That you were had been listed as a uh, the pediatrician at the time. Yes, whenever a baby is born, the parents are asked who they want the pediatrician to be, or who they want the physician to be to take care of the baby, and that is uh, recorded uh, in the state registry, I guess. And so, whenever the results of the newborn screening comes back, they make sure they send it to the address that's associated with that physician. Okay, and so when you saw the baby on February seventh. Um, would you explain to the members of the jury what took place during his appointment, what your exam involved and what you found? Yes, he came in with uh, both his, his mother and father, and uh, there was nothing really out of the ordinary as far as exam, what they do, they come in and get a set of vital signs, get, get the weight, and then their uh, nurse asks some questions about how they're feeding and you know if they have any concerns or, or problems, and then they're placed in a room. And I come in, I talk to them, ask them a, kind of similar questions and make sure everything's going okay. Then do a physical exam, just ask about uh, feeding and, and that sort of thing, and, and dirty diapers and wet diapers and how, how they're sleeping. Um, there was the only thing that was out of the ordinary uh, that I recall from this visit was uh, that he had had this, this abnormal uh, screening test, and so I talked to them about that and asked them to go over to Southern Ohio Medical Center to have some lab work done to make sure that even though the test had come back with an elevated level for the state lab, that he was in fact normal. And um, so that, that was it. We, we had prayer and then uh, they left and went apparently to the hospital and had the lab work done. Okay. Um did they report, the parents report, whether baby Dylan was bottle or breastfed? Uh, yes, they would have. It would be here in the note. I don't recall. I think bottle fed, but I can look and see. Okay. okay. Formula fed, Gerber, Gerber soup. Okay, and if you would um, tell the members of the jury what his height and weight was at that time. Okay. His weight was 7 pounds and 2 ounces, and his length was 19 and a half inches. Okay. And then you said you do um, a general examination. Um, does that mean you do, part of that is a musculoskeletal examination? Yes. Okay, so what do you do when you do that part of the examination, if you would explain that to the jury? Okay. So, you know, we start with just looking generally at the baby's skin, uh, make sure the color is normal, there's not too, too much jaundice, that they're not, uh, that they're pink, they're not cyanotic, and then, uh, you know, you go from the head down, make sure that there's nothing abnormal about, about the head, ears, eyes, throat, move, you know, make sure the baby is moving the arms well and has something called a Moreau reflex so that you can kind of pull up on the little baby's hands and just gently kind of let them go and startle, make sure they have symmetric movement of the arms, uh, check the legs, make sure that the tone is good in the legs, the muscles are good. We, we, we check the hips by, by what we call abducting the hips. We hold the, the knees flexed and then go out with the hips and make sure that the hips are not dislocatable. Um, and then just kind of see how the baby's moving. So that's the general musculoskeletal exam that we do. Okay, and everything appeared to be normal from that visit? It did. Okay. Um, is it your policy in your office to schedule the next appointment before they leave? Would you schedule in advance? Uh-huh. Okay. And so when was the next time they were supposed to return? Let me see. Uh, we asked to follow up at the two month, two months and six to uh, eight weeks. And let's see. So 
I'm not sure. I don't see a, a date on this that they actually. Let me refer you, I believe, towards the front of your chart. Okay, that's You provided good. Um, a document to our office that's labeled future appointments. Okay. I think there's two of them there. Yes. Okay. And so do you see one that looks like yes, the one that I have? Yes, it says March 21st, February 7th and March 21st. If you'll go to the next page. Okay. Sorry. That's okay. Um, and then what are what is the earliest date there? March the February the 21st. Okay. And does that, I'm sorry, the sheet you're holding there match the sheet I'm holding? It does. Okay. And from your records, doctor, did they appear on um, February 21st with baby Dylan? They did. Okay. If you'll refer to that part of the chart. Again, what's the purpose of that visit? Well, we uh, think we wanted them to come back a little bit sooner because of the, uh, usually they come back at, at two months. So this was a little earlier than two months. It's about almost six weeks. But uh, one of the concerns, I guess, of course, was uh, the abnormal newborn screen. Again, we, when we sent him to the lab, they did part of the lab work that we ordered, but there was a, an error made at the hospital somewhere in the lab or registration, I'm not sure where, and they didn't do the second part of the tests that we had ordered. So we had the electrolytes that came back that were normal, that's the sodium and potassium in the blood, which were normal and very reassuring that he did not have the condition that the new, newborn screen indicated that he might have. But there was another test that I was looking for uh, that was not done. That was a repeat of the newborn screen, and so okay. they didn't do that. Let me ask you, are these follow-up screenings that you're requesting in regards to the abnormal screening that showed that he may have abnormal or elevated levels of 17 hydroxyprogesterone? Yes. Okay. At some point, was that eliminated? It was eliminated because... You have to understand that I was not the physician that took care of the child in the hospital at Southern Ohio Medical Center. So they came to me subsequent to that. And I didn't realize that they had done a 17 hydroxy progesterone at the hospital before he ever left. So with his normal serum electrolytes that were done on the 7th uh, of February, coupled with the normal 17 hydroxy progesterone level that was done while he was in the hospital, that pretty much eliminates the risk for him having that condition, uh, 21 hydroxylase deficiency or genital adrenal hyperplasia. So he did not have that, but I didn't realize that. So that was why I kept, I didn't realize he had that other test done. So it was one of the reasons I kept trying to- You kept to, asking the parents asking to the take parents him. parents to do that. Did they take him to your knowledge? The second time, they took him the first time, but I don't know. We never were able to get the repeat newborn screening done. That were, they, they didn't go back. Okay. Um, is my we'll, understanding. We'll come back to that in just a second. Um, so let me direct your attention back to this February 21st uh, office visit. Who presented there at the office with the baby? I believe it was mom and dad. Okay. And again, if you would, tell the members of the jury what his height and weight was at that visit. Yes, his, his weight was, well, it was 17 pounds, 15, seven, seven pounds, 15 ounces, although it says seven pounds, 16 ounces. I don't know how that happened. But it's seven, it was seven pounds, 15 ounces when I went back and looked. But, uh, and his length was 20.3 inches. Okay. Um, and if we reflect back to the future appointment sheet that we just looked at um, and the one before that, what were the next scheduled appointments for baby Dylan? So March, March the 2nd, March the 7th, I'm sorry, and uh, which meant two weeks after this one, and then, you know, May the 2nd. Okay. 
And would it be fair to say that March the 7th was probably because you had asked them to go again to get more testing? I think that was part of it. Part of it was, too, that his, his weight percentile was, was on the lower end uh, of normal, and so I wanted to make sure that he continued to gain at a normal rate. So he was gaining, but not as much as you'd like? Not quite as much as I would like. Okay. But, but he started out with a low birth weight, so it was, it was okay. I just want to make sure it continued to be okay. Okay. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, you did not ever see baby Dylan again after that, is that right? I did not. Okay. During that February 21st exam, um, do you again perform that musculoskeletal uh, examination that you demonstrated here for the jury about moving all the body parts and feeling him all over? Yes. Okay. No indication that he was injured at that time? No. Okay. And it looks like from the records you provided, your staff was attempting to contact the parents but not getting a response. Yes, I don't think we ever made contact, I think, by phone. I think we sent a letter that we did not hear back from. Okay. documents in your records. And are those the same documents that I'm holding? They are. Okay. And so in referring to that exhibit, would it be fair to say that your office sent a letter to the parents on February 26, 2019? Yes. Okay. And what was that letter in reference to? It was in reference to the, uh, the laboratory uh, at Mobile State Lab. Okay. And so you're asking the parents? To, to contact us. Uh, and it also says, so please give our office a call concerning the lab work that must be completed for Dillon, the state, and that's talking about the state of Ohio uh, and their, their laboratory system. Those people have reached out to us about this repeat newborn screening. If the test is not repeated, they will involve Children's Protective Services. I'm sorry if this has caused any inconvenience for you, but this must be repeated. Talking about that the newborn screen. Okay, and then there's also a, a letter sent from your office on April 1st, is that right? Yes. Okay, and what's that letter in reference to? It says, it is very important that you call our office, and it provides the number, 606-932-2079. Uh, Please ask for Anita Jacobs. Okay, and your office was continuing to call by phone and not getting not getting a response yeah, I, at that I can't time. tell you exactly how many times or, or I don't have those those okay. times actually recorded. All right. If you would explain to the members of the jury what is the mobility of a baby approximately two to three months old? Uh, well, they, they pretty much stay where you put them. You know, they they uh, they move their arms and legs. Uh, they usually start start cooing and smiling around around two months, uh, but they're they're not really able to roll over consistently. Uh, they can't. They can't crawl. Uh, so they, they really don't don't have the ability uh, 
to, to go anywhere other than just kind of where you put them. Okay. And is a baby of that age capable of inflicting serious physical harm upon himself? I don't see how they could. Okay. Have you ever seen a two or three month old baby in your 30 years of practice that's caused a skull fracture to himself? No. Caused a rib fracture to himself? No. Caused an arm fracture? No. A leg fracture? No. Okay. What type of reaction would a, in your experience of 30 years, would a baby have if they have some serious injury like that? How do they react? Well, you talk about bone bone fractures, like yeah. leg fracture, femur fractures. Yes. Yeah, they would be they would be in a lot of pain, just like any of us would be. They they feel pain just like we feel pain. And, and how do so babies exhibit they would, symptoms they, they of pain? They cry. Uh, they they oftentimes they don't feed well. Uh, you it's evident whenever you move them that that they're that they're in pain. I mean, when I simply examine the hips sometimes in stretching those ligaments of the hips, I can see those babies, it hurts a little bit, and they let you know it. You know, they, they cry, they, uh, mostly they just, they cry, they just, and they'll, they'll let out screams, uh, but they let you know when they're hurting, and, and fractures hurt. Okay. Um, how does, what kind of symptom or sign would you expect to see if there was a fracture in your experience? In other words, how would you recognize, how would a parent recognize the baby has a fracture? What would we be looking for? Well, it, it depends on the type of fracture. Uh, if you have a, a fracture of, say, a long bone, say a humerus or femur or tibia, the long bones, uh, if, it's a, if it's completely broken in two, what we call a transverse fracture, then usually you could see that the, the leg or the arm is, is crooked. You know, it's not... It's not normal compared to the other one. Uh, oftentimes there's swelling, uh, but there's always pain. Okay. Always what pain. about skull fractures? Skull fractures are often associated with bruising, uh, but uh, not, not always. But again, they're, they're, they're painful. Would and there be swelling associated possibly? Usually, but, but not, not always, but usually, yes, there would be. Could a skull fracture result in a brain bleed? Yes. Okay. If I could have just a second. <clears throat> Your Honor, I don't have any further questions at this time. Ms. Hutchinson, uh, Mr. Stratton, you may cross the team of the witness. Thank you, Your Honor. <coughs> Good afternoon, Dr. Hudson. Good afternoon. Uh, just a few questions here. Um, you saw you, you uh, saw Jessica Groves and Dylan and Daniel Groves in your office twice, correct? Yes. Okay. Either visit. Um, what was your observations of the demeanor of the parents? You know, there there really wasn't anything that that stood out in my mind. Okay. Uh, you know. Really, the only thing I would say is one of the things that I, I like to do is I like to have just a, a word of prayer. God would bless the baby. And, uh, and usually, uh, and, and it, it, they just, you know, the only thing I would say is when I got done praying, they just kind of looked at me a little differently than what I'm used to. That's all. But I, don't, I didn't make anything out of it okay. at all. That was the only thing I would say uh, okay. that, was, that was a little bit different about the visit. That's it. So they asked the appropriate questions, answered the appropriate questions. You don't know, remember specifically questions they ask. Okay. Uh, but, you know, parents are all different. Right. Some come in and they, they, they've had experience and they don't have a lot of questions. Yeah. So I don't interpret them by not asking questions to, to, to think that, you know, you know, there's something up or, or they're bad parents. Okay. Other parents uh, keep me in there a long time asking a lot of yeah. questions. Yes. But there was nothing, nothing strange nothing about this. Nothing struck you, yeah, other than what I told you, nothing okay. at all. You mentioned, uh, <clears throat> you mentioned that typically a baby at this age, if he had some of the injuries that the prosecution had mentioned, that there would be pain involved. 
Like would, broken bones and yes. skull fractures? And, right. Yes. Yes. Uh, if a baby was in pain like that, the baby would scream, be crying? Yes. Okay. Would the baby be screaming and crying if the baby was under the influence of a drug or a substance, like a narcotic? See, when its arm was broken, but it was given or had drugs in its system, would this baby be crying? I would think so, you know, unless they were given, like, uh, medically high doses of some kind of narcotic, like, you know, if they're in the hospital, the intensive care unit, uh, and, and you have to give them medication like that to sedate them. Uh, but those kind of medications are very sedating. So if you have high enough levels to suppress, I think, the pain from a broken bone, typically you're going to have a baby that's, that's almost subtunded or, or going to be very, very sleepy and not waking up and not eating and wouldn't be acting normally when you see them. What about illegal substances? If a baby had illegal substances in his system, can you Could specify that, illegal substance you're talking like, about? Let's say methamphetamines, amphetamines. That's not a pain killer. Okay. So, so none no, of that? that would not that would not in any way alleviate pain. Okay. When you talked about uh, fractures to the skull, you said that they're not always bruising and swelling associated with those? Not invariably. Usually, but not, not always. Not always. Okay. No further questions, John. Thank you, Mr. Stratton. Uh, Ms. Scott, you may cross-examine the witness. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Dr. Hudson. Good afternoon. Do you recall um, if you also treated um, the Groves' older child, Daniel Groves Jr. or not? I know Daniel's been in the office, but I don't remember the last time that I saw him. But this family has a prior relationship with you outside of Dylan Groves. They had your child, had their other they child in their office. They have been in the office with, with Daniel. Daniel was actually, I think he was in that day, uh, according to records, I did, I did look at that before I came in. I just don't remember that interaction. But yes, I did. It is in our records that I saw Daniel uh, the day of the first visit of Dylan to the office. On, so on February 7th of 2019, yes. you would have had a visit with both Daniel Jr. and Dylan yes. at the same time. Okay. So this in different rooms, though. They weren't together. Sure. <laughs> sure. Well, one's probably 13, 14 at the time, and then yes. you have an infant baby. So, okay, I get you. Um, but this family had a prior relationship with you, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, so you've had multiple times to observe them. I just can't, you know, I would have to go back and look. Sure. So I can't, I can't really comment to that as far as observing them over multiple times. I'm sorry. Again, it's just one of those things I, I see no, a lot of patients that don't remember. That's okay. You, I almost feel like you're thinking I'm going to ask you a trick question. It's not a trick question. I just, right. I'm just, I guess what I'm saying, but I want to answer truthfully. Sure. So I, 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 even going back and looking at the times that Daniel's been in the office, there wasn't a lot. Uh, I think that in, in our records that we've had for the past almost three years now, I think there was only a couple of visits. One of them was from uh, February the 7th, and then he may have been out in our Lucasville office, which we had a different medical record, and so I didn't go back and look at that to see how many times he'd been out there and if I had seen him there. Okay. Um, but do you did anything that you did review or look at um, give you any suspicion um, when baby Dylan was brought in that these parents were not going to be compliant with what you asked them to do? No, I thought they would be compliant with what okay, I asked them great. to do. Okay, um, great. And as far as you know, they went over there and attempted to um, perform that lab test and there was some kind of error and... Yeah, they went They went as I, as I asked them to do okay. uh, and they did uh, that, that first time they did exactly what I requested them to do and the, the mistake was made on the, the, the hospital's part. The, the hospital made the mistake, correct? Yes. Okay. But it was the follow-up that we were unable to get them to go back. Okay. I, um, and I believe that you already um, stated that you didn't see anything odd or out of the way other than at the conclusion of this one prayer you thought they kind of looked at you funny. 
Yeah, that's the only thing. And I wouldn't even bring that up except I was asked, and I, and I, I swore okay. that I would tell everything. But truthful. they know that that's kind of a practice that you have with your patients, that sometimes you say prayers with your patients yes, at the end. Yes, it is. Okay, so that wasn't unusual. No, and they didn't object, because I okay. asked them beforehand. I'll just break sure. down into a prayer. Sure, sure. So. Yeah, and that's a, and that's a practice in your, in your doctor's office. And, but they didn't, it was just a look. That's and, all. And, That's and, all. And they didn't say anything out of the way. No, they did not. They didn't um, negate anything you said. Or... It might have been just surprise. I don't okay. know. It wasn't. It wasn't anything. <laughs> okay. Mean or, or unkind. Okay. Um, and I know that you were addressed or asked to address um, the issue of a potential skull fracture. Um, do you know how long it takes for um, a small skull fracture to heal or show signs of healing? I think, I think you should be able to see some, some signs of healing within a couple of weeks on a re-x-ray, I think. Okay. And the pain and the bruising that you talked about with uh, broken bones or skull fracture, um, would that subside over somewhat of a period of time once that healing began? Yeah, it takes, uh, of course, younger babies heal quicker. Uh, typically, you think about six weeks for a, you know, uh, like a long bone fracture, humerus or uh, radius ulnus, femur, tibia to, to heal. Right. Uh, so you would expect there would be some tenderness or some abnormality that you could see, depending on the severity of the fracture. Right. Uh, if it was completely broken in two, you should be able to see that, uh, a swelling, uh, you know, even weeks later. But if we're talking about a skull fracture uh -huh. um, that is not very long in length, maybe less than two inches, yeah, yeah, um, that was not a, like a crushing, yeah, not a it's, crushing it's a injury. Yeah, if it's a non skull fracture, a simple uh, a skull fracture. You know. I want to call it a clean break, but maybe associated, like, I, I, I don't even, like. A, as far as, so. You're saying, what are, you, what are you asking me? I'm sorry. Like if, if the length of it, if there, it's not a crushing skull injury. Uh -huh. There's not an indentation of the bone. Well, not a depressed It's skull merely a line uh -huh. fracture. Uh -huh. And obviously I'm not a medical person, so I'm not sure what the terminology is. Um, how long would that take to start showing signs of healing, if you are aware? Well, you know, I, I guess I can't, I can't say for sure. To okay. show signs, you mean like by... When you say signs of healing, you're saying that the bone that you was starting to knit back together. That you could x ray and see that there was healing? That's correct. Okay. Uh, you, you might see some signs on x ray in just a few days. Okay. But it may, it may take long. But I, right. I, I'm really not, I don't feel like I, I know enough about that to comment definitively. Okay. I mean, I know what I've read, and usually within a few days, but, but okay. that's not something I follow. Okay. And then um, any bruising or possible swelling that would be associated with that, would that go away after a few days as well? You know, it depends, again, on how much uh, tissue damage there was at the time of the skull fracture. Uh, sometimes there can be skull fractures, babies can fall out of grocery carts and not even have a bruise. Uh, so to say that the bruising will be gone in a few days uh, is, is kind of a difficult question to answer, but I think if there's a lot of trauma uh, to the subcutaneous tissue, then you could have, you could be a parent there for, you know, two weeks later, you could still see bruising. Because bruising is simply blood that, from the trauma that gets underneath the skin, and as that blood is reabsorbed, it goes from being kind of a dark purple to a, to a reddish, to a, to a, to a, a kind of a, a brown, a yellow, and then it, it, it is gone. So let's use your um, example that you just gave, that if a baby fell out of a shopping cart and caused a, a skull fracture, mm -hmm. um, that would not be like a crushing injury, correct? It could be. It depends, on how, you know, depends on how far they depends fell on how the baby what lands. they landed on. Right. There have been some really serious injuries, although rare, mm -hmm. children who've fallen right. from that height. Right. But you use the example that sometimes you may not even see anything associated with Sometimes there not, may not be much right. of an external evidence of a skull fracture other than an x-ray, which is, of course, not external. Right. But as far as just examination right. with your eyes, 
in hands, you may not, you may not be able to detect it. Right. But that's what I was getting at. So there may be some incidents that would result in a skull fracture that may show no outward signs, such as bruising or swelling. That can happen. Thank you, that's what I needed to know. Thank you so much, Dr. Hudson, I appreciate it. Any further questions, Ms. Scott? No, Your Honor, thank you. They redirect. To Sophia. Doctor, you were asked about suspicion that they would not be compliant. And mm -hmm. you said in February, early February, you had no suspicion that they would not be compliant. And in fact, on February 7th, they did comply with your request. Yes. Okay. But thereafter, they did not. February 21st, they did not. No. And, and then I they... I did explain to them, you know, from my perspective, why this was so important. Okay. And then they failed to show up for future appointments and failed to have contact with your offer, office after that. Yes. Okay. You were asked about whether a baby would exhibit signs of pain if he were on illicit substances or um, prescription drugs, um, but the topic came up of methamphetamine and you said that's not a pain medicine. Yes. What does methamphetamine do to the body? What does methamphetamine do? Yeah, what effect does it have on an infant's body if, if a baby's exposed to a methamphetamine? Well, you would expect the baby is, you know, amphetamines are stimulants, okay? So uh, you would expect the baby to, to be uh, crying a lot. You know what the babies do? They, you get overstimulated, you expect them to cry a lot, you expect them to not sleep uh, if they were under, you know, influence of methamphetamine, maybe not to eat well, maybe to vomit, but... Uh, but sleeping and, and, and not experiencing pain, I wouldn't think would be a side effect. As a pediatrician, do you chart the circumference of a baby's skull or head? Yes. If you would tell the members of the jury what the, ba the circumference of that baby's head was on February 21st. Six centimeters. Okay. And I'm a lawyer for a reason. How many inches would that be? Well, uh, divide know? that by uh, 2.54. So you're talking roughly around the, you know, maybe 14 I inches. apologize, doctor. That's okay. <laughs> um, but if you, if you know. Well, I'd have to, yeah, so you, you 36.8 divided by 2.54. Someone want to do that real quick? <laughs> I can't do that on my head. The judge has a calculator head. for you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Your Honor. All right, appreciate that. Uh, coming on. 14.5 inches. Okay, and how is that measured, if you would explain that to the jury? Uh, we have a... Uh, a, a tape measure that uh, fits around the, the head, and so you wrap it around and you just read the number. Okay. So if baby Dylan had a two-inch skull fracture, that wouldn't be considered a little skull fracture. If his whole head is 14 inches around. Uh, no, I would think two inches. Two inches is a significant skull fracture. Yeah. So it's a one-inch. Skull Any fracture. fracture is significant, absolutely. I have nothing further, Your Honor. <clears throat> Any recross, Mr. Shred? No, Your Honor. Ms. Scott? Your Honor, if I have just a second. You may. Is this what is excused? When is yes, sir. Yes, sir. Free, free to go. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Philippe, the records. That's what I thought. No.
State may call their next witness. Your Honor, State will call Andrea Bowling. I commonly swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Please have a seat. And ma'am, we do have media in the courtroom this afternoon. Do you have any objection to your image being filmed or photographed during your testimony? No objection. Mr. Keeman, you may inquire. Thank you. Ma'am, would you state your name for the record? And how do you spell your last name? B-O-W-L-I-N-G. Thank you. How are you employed? I'm a teacher. Where are you a teacher at? Menford Elementary School. How long have you been a teacher? 18 years. In that time as a teacher, what age groups have you taught? Second grade for 10 years and third grade for eight years. In your time at uh, teaching, has, has that been all inside of the county? Yes, all at Menford. All at Menford? Menford Elementary. How has teaching evolved inside the county over those 20 years? How, I'm sorry. How has teaching evolved inside the county over those 20 years? How has teaching evolved inside the county? Yeah. Are the kids any different these days or? Oh, yeah, I, yeah from when I first started, yeah, you, there's a big difference in, in kids and their home dynamic and okay. sometimes behavior. Um, have, what, what kind of differences have there been? Uh, since the drug epidemic, you, there's been a lot more um, children with uh, being raised by grandparents and um, or... Uh, you know, their family um, is just kind of suffering and, and they're having difficulties at home due to the, due to mainly drugs and um, they need a lot more emotional support and um, compassion and help from teachers. So your duties at school have expanded from just the normal two plus two, I'd say. Oh, absolutely, yes. Now, it's my understanding that you've been a foster parent. Mm -hmm. You need to answer out loud for us. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. Yes. And when did you become a foster parent? Um, I was certified in t July of 2017. And what process do you go through to become a foster parent? Uh, we have to take um, classes that train us, 40 hours of classes that train us about different um, things that we need to know as far as kids that might come into the system that we would be taking care of. And um, we have to have drug tests, um, medical physicals, uh, home inspection, um, home studies. Anyone in the home has to take a drug test and also have medical physicals. Um, there's a lot to it. There's um, the there fire department had to come out and inspect the house to make sure it was safe. Um, yeah, there's okay. a lot of a lot of things. Are there, there different the types of foster parents that a person can become? I'm sorry. Are there different types of foster care that can be provided or training for for foster parents? Yes. There's and um, are there different types of foster care? Yes. Yes, you can be trained completely to just foster, or you can be trained to foster to adopt. You can be trained for medically fragile foster children. What, what type of training did you receive? I, I received the foster to adopt training. And why did you receive the foster to adopt training? Um, when I first decided to become a foster parent, I um, was just planning on fostering. Um, I'm 41 years old. I've raised a son who's now in college. And I was just planning on fostering. And um, as I was starting to get all of the paperwork, oh, we had to have BCI and federal background checks too. Um, as we got all of our paperwork together, 
Um, Children's Services said, you know, you may want to consider foster to adopt. It's just a few more hours, and you know, if you don't get it tagged in into this, you know, you may wish you did later. And I said, okay, you know, yeah, I'll do that. So I went ahead and did foster to adopt. Okay. Seemed like the right thing to do at the time. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, before we uh, get to January of 2019, um, had you had uh, previous foster children? Yes. I had two, a six and seven year old, um, and I had them for a year and four months okay. before they were reunited. Okay. And uh, prior to January of 2019, had you ever had an infant before? Uh, a foster care infant? No. Okay. I mean, I'd raise my son. Certainly as a mother, you've had <laughs> right. a Right, yeah. So. Yeah. I'd like to direct your attention now to January of 2019. Okay. Uh, what happened in January of that year? Okay, so... The two foster children that I had um, previously, they were reunited in November of 2018. So I went December and then part of January before I got a phone call. And then I was te teaching, sorry, that's what it is. I was teaching, um, getting ready to, to do attendance, and I got a phone call from Children's Services. And they said, we have a baby that used to be um, in foster care. Would you be willing to go pick him up later? And I, I said, um, yes. Yeah, I will do that. And I said, I'm teaching today, um, and I need to go get some clothes and diapers. And um, then I will go pick them up around 6. Would that be okay? And they said, Let, we'll call the hospital. And they did. And they got back with me, and that was okay. And so I ended up picking, going down there at 6 o'clock. Okay. If you would just, I, I can hear you, but if you can, and I you know. You can't it's a, hear me? If you can speak up a little bit more. Okay. Am I, is it a microphone right here? Or? That's a microphone there, but it's not a broadcast microphone. It's just a recording microphone. Okay, I'll talk louder. Yeah. yeah. You're a teacher. I know you can. I'll use that voice. Okay. <laughs> Uh, did you have anything to prepare for um, fostering an infant? Did I have anything to prepare was for? It, was there anything you needed to do before? Uh, you said you had to go get diapers, but was your yeah. house ready for an infant at right. that time? I had, from where I had my previous foster son, I had a room that was vacant. Um, my cousin uh, gave me the crib for Dylan. Um, and then I had a rocker recliner upstairs that I brought down so I could rock him. And then a friend of mine from church gave me a Mamaroo, which is a, it's a device like what they have at the hospital, which is kind of like a high-tech saucer type thing that rocks the babies um, and soothes them. And so we had one of those brought to the house and just, I have a really good support system of friends and family, and it was just like clothes were coming in, and and uh, it was almost immediate. I had everything I needed for it him. Seems like there was this mad scramble from your community of friends to. It was yes, it was a mad scramble, and then then we had a a room that was perfect for him. Um. So, were you were you advised of any uh, potential medical condition that Dylan had um, in this call to children from Children's Services? Yes. What was your understanding of uh, what you might might be dealing with? Um, they told me that he was born with drugs in his system and that he was withdrawing and that he was. Um, at that time, he was five pounds, four ounces. So he was really tiny. Um, that's basically what they told me. Okay. Um, so you mentioned you got to the hospital around six o'clock? Yes, around uh, six, 6.30. What hospital was that? SOMC. Okay. And once you got to the hospital, what, what did you do? 
Okay, so went to the, um, the nursery there at the hospital and uh, met with the nurses. They let me in and then I went through some training on how to, what signs to look for with a baby that's withdrawing and um, how to take care of a, a baby that is, um, you know, has, has been born with drugs in his system and, and you know, uh, for several hours, different types of training for how to take care of him. And then they had to do a car seat test with him because he was so small to make sure he could sit in a car seat. Um, and his, they checked his oxygen um, as he was sitting there for an hour. They had different things hooked up to him. So I watched him do that. And then um, after the car seat test, we, that's when we were ready to go home. Okay. And... Um what, what kind of vocational plans had you made initially when, when you were going to go home with Dylan? What kind of, I'm sorry, I can't. What kind of job plans? Did you have work that you had to go to? Or? Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm a teacher, so I, this was midweek that I got Dylan, and um, I didn't want to leave him with a babysitter or, or daycare, so I took, took 12 days off that I had him. I was going to take more. Um, you mentioned before that uh, you were advised that uh, uh, that uh, baby Dylan may have some um, some symptoms associated with with drug withdrawal. Yes. Okay. Um, did you did you observe any of these symptoms while he was in your care? Yes. What did you observe? He had tremors, or his arms would shake. Okay. If his legs would jerk. <laughs> he had sweats and he liked to be held at all times <laughs> when he wasn't asleep or in his mama room I was holding him Let's go ahead and take our afternoon recess at this point. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, remember my earlier admonition to you, do not discuss this case amongst yourselves or with anyone else. Do not permit anyone to discuss it with you or in your presence as your duty not to form or express an opinion on this case until it's finally submitted to you. And Ms. Bowling, I am going to uh, direct you not to discuss the substance of your testimony with anyone until you're back in the stand. Back on the record, State of Ohio versus Daniel Groves, State of Ohio versus Jessica Groves, 19 CR 586 A and B is the state ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. The defense ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Mr. Tiemann, you may continue your uh, inquiry. Thank you, Your Honor. Ma'am, during your time with uh, baby Dylan, did you uh, remain in contact with Children's Services? During my time that I had Dylan? Yes. Yes. Okay. And uh, were you responsible for taking him to see a pediatrician a few times? Yes. I okay. took him to Dr. Ali. Dr. Ali out of uh, Waverly? Yes. Okay. Um, in the time that you had Dylan, did he suffer any physical injuries? Any physical injuries? No. Yes. Okay. Right. I'd like to direct your attention to a uh, family team meeting at Children's Services Board. Uh, do you recall being part of a family team meeting? Yes. Uh, do you recall the date of that? The date of that? Yeah. Um, okay, so it was January 
25th, I believe. Okay, 24th or 25th, somewhere yeah, in there? Somewhere right okay. there, yeah. And um, that was followed by a, um, a visitation with the parents, is that right? Right, yes. Okay. I, met the, I met Dylan's parents, and then they. Okay, Daniel and Jessica them. Groves? Yes. Okay. Um, and then they visited with him for an hour. Okay. Um, were you part of that visitation? Um, I talked to, the, to them before um, before I left the room, but no, it was their time to spend with him. Okay. Approximately how long had you talked with them? Probably about five minutes. Okay. Did you have an opportunity in that five minutes to observe uh, the demeanor of the parents? Yes. Uh, what was Jessica's demeanor at at the time? Um, I felt like there was a possibility that she was under the influence of something at that time. Okay. Well, let me, let me see what your knowledge is of that kind of thing. Okay. So, um, as a school teacher, how many years of experience have you had teaching? Eighteen. Uh, in that 18 years of experience, have you had um, occasion to um, run into people or deal with people that are under the influence of substances? Yes. Okay. Uh, approximately how many times? Have I seen someone intoxicated or yeah. under the influence of drugs? Ten. Okay. Ten times maybe? Yeah. Is that in the last few years or is that over your entire career? Um, Probably in the last, I don't know, five, six years. Okay. And in your experience just being a citizen and, and, and growing up here and, and observing people on the streets, has, have you had experience with that as well? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. What kind of behavior was um, Mrs. Groves exhibiting? Um, she was kind of flailing her arms around and she was really happy and excited and um, more more giddy than happy. Um, okay. Now, is it fair to say that people are sometimes like that when they're happy? Mm -hmm. What made you think this was something not normal? Just under the circumstances, it was, it was um, kind of unexpected behavior to walk into children's services with the baby and um, and then to just see that, you know, she was, I just felt she was under the influence of something at that okay. time. Now, uh, what kind of demeanor did you see from uh, Mr. Groves? He was quiet. I didn't suspect anything as far as him being under the influence of anything. Okay. With regard to their demeanor, did you express some concerns to Children's Services? Yes. Okay. I asked if they would drug test. Okay. At some point, um, were you advised that Dylan was going to be placed back with his parents? I assumed he would be eventually. Not in 12 days, but eventually. Okay. When were you advised that he was going to be placed back? Was it at that meeting or shortly thereafter? No, it wasn't at that meeting. Um, I believe the meeting was on a Wednesday, and it was the, the, the Friday after that Wednesday. Um, I had actually called Children's Services to find out when our next visit was going to be because normally you have a weekly visit. And I was just calling to find out when our next visit was going to be so that I could you know, just have it on my schedule. Okay. And then they informed me that he was going to be reunited and to have him at the office that following Monday morning. Okay. Now, that following Monday, would that have been the 28th? Yes, yeah, it's okay. 28th. And were you part of the actual 
transition or exchange back to the family? Yes. Uh, Daniel was there to pick up Dylan. Um, when did he arrive? Okay, so I was there at 9, and he got there about 9.15. Okay. And uh, how was his demeanor then? The same. The same as the first time I met him. Okay. And um, what happened during that exchange? Um, we... Uh, he brought in a car seat for Dylan, and... I was getting Dylan's belongings together. What, uh, what, what did you do with those belongings? Uh, I gave them to Daniel. Okay. And I gave him um, go ahead. some formula diapers, his blanket, his quilt from the hospital, some pictures. I gave him a Bible. Okay. Now, I want to hand you what have been marked as states exhibits 23, 22 and 23. Showing these to the council. <coughs> Ma'am, I'm what's been marked as states exhibit. 22, do you recognize this item? Yes. Okay, what is this? It's actually a picture of a picture, but what is it? It's a picture of Dylan that I that I took. Okay, is that one of the pictures you gave to? Yes. Okay. So State's Exhibit 23, do you recognize that? Yes. What is it? Another picture of Dylan. Okay, is that a picture you took as well? Yeah. Identified those as Dylan Grove. Did you provide Daniel with anything else besides the? Um, I gave him a letter to him and Jessica. Okay. And uh, did you provide your number or anything? I did. That? I just basically in the letter said that how much I loved Dylan, cared about him, and that I just wanted to be, maybe, you know, if I could be involved or um, to have them maybe just let me know about some milestones that he reaches. Did you, uh, did you offer to help if they were needing help? I did. Help? I said, if you ever need anything, just call me, and I gave him my phone number. Did they ever reach out to you after that? No. Is Daniel Groves in the courtroom here today? Yes. Could you point him out for the court? He's over there. Over there. Is Jessica <laughs> Groves in the courtroom here today? She's standing over there. Your Honor, if the record could so reflect. Record reflect the witnesses pointed to and identified with the defendants, Daniel Groves and Jessica Groves. Thank you, ma'am. No further questions, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Tiedemann. Mr. Stratton, you may cross examine. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Mrs. Rowling. Good afternoon. Um, you mentioned that you're a teacher out of Memphis. Right. Okay. You mentioned that over the years that you have taught that you have seen our drug problem firsthand. Right. You've seen it in the kids, um, yes. the way they're dealing with stuff and how they act in class. Yeah, the effects of different things, yes, with that. Okay. I'm guessing some of that had to do with why you became a foster parent. It is, yes. I had a couple of foster kids in my room, and they kind of brought me to the decision of becoming a foster parent. Okay. Uh, earlier, you mentioned that when you took Dylan as a foster kid, that you heard, got a crib and 
stuff from different places. Yeah. Let me ask you, how much as a foster parent are you out of pocket that you spend on your own? Oh, a lot. A lot. <laughs> yeah. Does Children's Services reimburse you for every bit of that? That we get for buying things for Yeah, let's say you, you said you got a crib or diapers or stuff like that. Do they reimburse you for all that, everything that you spend? No. No, okay. As a foster to adopt, you understand that Children's Services tries to reunify with the family. Right. Okay. And you've had that happen in the past? Right. And with this case, correct? Correct. Okay. And it is hard, I'm sure. It is hard. You get attached. You get attached. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when Dylan was returned, and let me correct something. Earlier, I think you said that the family team meeting on what was on January 25th. I think it was the 24th. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think that's what that's what Patricia Kraft earlier testified to. That okay, was on the 24th. 24th. I think you called on the 25th back. Okay. To, to make your comments to Children's Services on the 25th. On the 25th. Yeah. Okay. Um, when you, so you had the team meeting on the 24th. Okay. During or after that team meeting, did you make any comments to Children's Services about? Raise your question, please. Yes, Your Honor. Mrs. Bowling, um, when you made a phone call to Children's Services, you had a couple of comments about Jessica Groves specifically. What were those comments? I felt like she was under the influence of something. I oh. felt like she was high on something. But you didn't mention that on the day of the family team meeting, did you? I did. I called after the team meeting. Okay. There's, are you surprised that there is no record of you calling after the team meeting on the 24th? Am I surprised? No. Okay. Why are you not surprised? I'm just not. Okay. Does CPS, Children's Services, listen to you often? Your Honor, Okay. Well, let me be more specific on this issue here. Um, you knew that Dylan was going to be returned to the father. Right. You objected to that, correct? I, I didn't feel like 12 days was long enough. Yes, okay. I disagree okay. with that. All right, we'll leave it there. Is it fair to say, Ms. Bowling, that without people like you as a foster parent, foster to adopt, that our system with children's services would not function? Is that fair to say? That children's services wouldn't function if there weren't foster parents? Yes. Right, yeah. Okay. And that is because of people like you who are willing to take in children that we're able to take care of drug addicted babies. Right. No further questions, Thank you, Mr. Stratton. Mr. Scott, you may cross examine the witness. Good afternoon. You are a foster parent. You are not an employee of the Children's Services, Seta County Children's Services Board, are you? An employee? Yeah, you're not an employee. No. Okay. I'm a foster um, parent. You're a foster parent, correct. And um, is it fair to say that um, it is the agency um, and the agency's um, decision um, and the guidelines that they must follow that dictate um, the reunification standards. Is that correct? It is their decision, not mine. Okay. And um, that they were the ones, although you were a participant in the team meeting, um, it is 
They're when I say the team meeting was just me meeting Daniel and Jessica and then okay. them visiting with Dylan. That okay. Was the so there meeting. was no discussion no. at that time in regards to what was to be accomplished no by plan, the parents nothing. right, or anything like that was involved in no, that meeting at all? No, it was just meeting each other. Okay, great. I'm glad you cleared that up. Um, but you do agree at the end of the day it is the agency and the standards that they set and the guidelines that they must follow is what led to Dylan being placed back with Daniel Gross. Right, it wasn't definitely not my decision. Okay, thank you. No further questions, Your Honor. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Any redirect? No, Your Honor. Thank you, Ms. Bowling. Is this witness excused? Excuse. She is, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Teeman? Yes, Your Honor. She's not sat in during the trial. Is there any thought that she'll be recalled to testify? You don't need to make that decision now, counsel. I'll let you. Your Honor, we don't anticipate calling Ms. Ms. Bowling back to testify if she's so inclined to uh, witness any of the trial. It's, uh, we have no objection. Ms. Scott, Mr. Shred. I do not. You want to approach? No, no, we can address it. Oh, um, I do not anticipate calling her as a witness um, in our case in chief, Your Honor. So I would have no objection. Is there any objection to me releasing her from the earlier separation order if she chooses to sit in? No, Your Honor, there's no objection. No objection. And you can step out. You're certainly welcome to sit in if you wish. You're certainly not required to. Mr. Teeman, you may call your next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. Honor, the state would call Adam Giles. Detective, can you raise your right hand for me, please, sir? You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Please have a seat. You may inquire. Thank you, Your Honor. Sir, if you would, introduce yourself to the jury and spell your last name for the record. Um, Adam Giles, G-I-L-E-S. I'm a detective with Soda County Sheriff's Office. Been employed there for 20 years. For how long? 20. Okay. If you would, explain to the members of the jury what some of your job duties are as a detective at the Scioto County Sheriff's Office. Uh, primarily investigating any crimes that uh, rise to the degree of felony, such as uh, breaking and entering burglary, rapes, felonious assault, stuff like that. Let me direct your attention to June 2019. Did you have an occasion to become involved in the investigation of Daniel and Jessica Groves? I did. Explain to the jury how you became involved. Uh, the morning of June 10th, I believe it was, uh, when I arrived at work, I was told by my uh, immediate supervisor, which is Captain Murphy, that uh, he had had a meeting with the prosecutor's office and they wanted to obtain a search warrant for the residence of Daniel Groves on uh, Mount Hope Road, and he asked that I take care of that for it. Okay. What was, what was the nature of the concern? What, why were they, why was there a they search warrant? They were looking warrant? for the missing child, Dylan. Looking for the baby that was nobody had seen baby Dylan? Correct. Okay. So as a result of that, what did you do? Uh, he gave me a little bit of the backstory, told me about the conversations he'd had at the prosecutor's office. Uh, I dug through uh, some of our records, times we'd been out there, uh, obtained a copy of the court order from Judge Lemons, uh, directing Children's Services and the Sheriff's Office to uh, go looking for the child and take possession of the child. I uh, looked at our call logs to see how many times we'd been out there, stuff relative to building my probable cause to take the, the warrant to the judge to be signed. Okay. So are you saying to the jury that you prepared that warrant on behalf of your office? I did. Okay. Um, what did you do after that? Uh, once I gathered the information, I typed up the affidavit for the warrant, uh, brought it to the uh, prosecutor's office to be reviewed by the prosecutor. Uh, there were some minor changes made at that point. I took it to the judge, uh, swore out the affidavit in front of him, and he uh, issued our warrant to search the residence. Okay. Explain to the jury what takes place after you secure that warrant from the judge. Uh, once I got the warrant, I went back to our office and started to prepare uh, a plan to go execute the warrant. 
Um, called some of the guys. Most of my time in, of my employment was spent on the drug task force. Those are guys I've served a lot of warrants with, so I asked for their assistance. Uh, they came to our office. We got a uh, plan together for the execution and then proceeded out to the, the residence on Mount Hope Road. Okay. Why do you ask for assistance from other officers? Just the nature of the, the warrant itself. I mean, going into somebody's home with a search warrant is one of the most intrusive things we do as, as law enforcement. We want to make sure everything is correct. We want to make sure we have the proper manpower for the situation and so on and so forth. Okay. And after that, did you respond to 2241 Mount Hope Road? I did. Okay. And what, if you would explain to the members of the jury how you guys set up out there and what happened? Okay. Uh, during our planning, uh, different options were talked about, about how we would go about the execution. Uh, sometimes it's dynamic. We come up, knock on the door, wait a couple minutes, announce ourselves, and knock down the front door. We had decided this time that that's not something we were going to do. We were going to use a, a technique called surround and call out or breach and hold, which uh, basically, if we're not running in there to secure evidence that we think they're destroying or something like that, it's safer for us and it's safer for the people uh, at that residence. If we just simply show up, we surround the house, make it known that we're there, make it known that we have a search warrant, and ask the residents to exit the home before we go in and look for the stuff we're looking for. So okay. we decided that that would be the best method in this situation, and that's what we proceeded out there and did. And how are you asking that the residents to come out of there? Over the PA speaker. I mean, initially we knocked on the door, told them the sheriff's office search warrant, uh, we got no response to that. We started. Is that done loudly? Yes, absolutely. Okay. We want everybody to know who we are and, and what we're doing there, just so they don't mistake us for someone trying to break into their home. What we call a cop knock. Yes. So you're beating on the door. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Does anybody come out at that time? No, not at that point, no ma'am. Okay. So then you said you utilize the PA system. You're amplifying your voice. Correct. PA what are you system. saying out there? This is the sheriff's office. We have your house surrounded. I'm calling Daniel by name, telling him to come out of the house. Uh, we had a fairly good indication he was there initially. Once we came down the driveway, we had uh, four or five officers that were ready to go up to the front door and deployed different officers to the back corners of the house. During our very initial approach, one of the officers on the back said he, it appeared that somebody had looked out the back door. So okay. we, we, we assumed somebody was in there, didn't know who. Okay. How long are you out there doing this before anyone appears, or does anyone appear? I think it was about uh, 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, Jessica comes to the front door and comes out, out of the house. That What's her demeanor at the front door? She's aggravated, irritated, upset that we're there, screaming at us. What's she screaming? You know, what the F are you doing here? leave us alone, we didn't do anything, what do you want, why are you, just, she's very agitated at our presence there at that point. Okay. Does she come out of the house? Yes, she comes out of the house and comes to us. Is that at your direction? Yes. Okay. Um, do you ask her about the whereabouts of Daniel Gross? We do. What does she tell you? I mean, my initial, we, we get her away from, a, there's a single wide trailer, there's a camper and a truck in the driveway at the time. We've kind of at this point taken a position behind this truck and the camper as we're, we're shouting commands at the house. So we bring her back to us, which why, is behind. Why are you doing that? We're, we're behind cover and concealment just in case there's, there's something that, that occurs there. We get her back to us and I, I, I inquire with her who else is in the house. Uh, she, not very cooperative with me, doesn't want to tell me who's in the house. I ask her if Daniel's in there. I, I get vague answers to everything I ask. Uh, I ask if Dylan was in there, if the baby was there. Uh, she initially said we don't have a baby. I pressed her on the, she mentions about her, another child that was with somebody else. And we informed her that we were there looking for the baby. She, she informed me at that point that children's services had come prior to me, didn't indicate whether it was a day, a week, or whatever, and had the child at that time. Okay. Do you take additional measures to ascertain whether the defendant, Daniel Groves, is inside that residence? 
we repeatedly asked her. Um, like I said, she was very agitated. She didn't like our presence there. Um, there was a, a, a heated moment between officers. She was cussing at them. They were hollering at her. Okay, let me interrupt you just effect. for a second. Do you make any kind of approach or entry to the house? At that point, no. <clears throat> After this whole conversation where you're, you're telling me you're not getting anywhere? Yes. Okay. At, the, at that point, we had taken Jessica and put her in uh, a court or a uh, vehicle with one of the court officers, Greg Dunham. He was back there trying to ascertain where the child was from her and whether Daniel was in the house as we're, we're continuing to, to yell on the PA to get somebody else. Because in the same time period, the same guy out back thinks he still saw somebody at the back door once she's exited us from the front. He's not 100% positive, so we still think somebody's inside, so we get her back up the driveway, and we're still trying to make contact with whoever's in the house and get them to come out. A period of time, probably 20 minutes goes on. We can see in one end of the trailer, it's, it's, it's kind of all windows. Let me interrupt you just for a second. Um, I'm gonna show you what's in Marcus Stacy's If I could show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 24 and ask you if you recognize that document. That's a rough draft of the outline of, outline of what I saw out there, and I, I drew that myself. Okay. Yes. Can you put that up here on the <coughs> the areas inside the trailer, so I wanted to have a diagram so that the jury could understand what you're talking about. Yeah, we had taken a position right around where, where that uh, smaller uh, thing is, where the camper is. We can see in windows from the far end of the camper, which is in the end of the trailer marked kitchen. We approach those windows and we can see into the kitchen. There's a small island type uh, thing out there. And then into the living room. I don't see, we don't see anybody in there. There's some dogs in there. Dogs are barking this entire time. Through the kitchen, like I said, we can see into there. We're not, we're not getting any contact with anybody inside the, the trailer at this point. And Detective, if you would, I think the judge has a pointer that you, laser pointer that you can use to show the jury where you are and what you're yeah, doing. We're, we're looking in windows down here at this end of the trailer. We can see limited what's in the first two rooms, so we're not making any contact with who's anybody inside. So the, the team that was assembled out front, we decided to do what's called a breach and hold or limited penetration, which means we're going to open the door up, we're going to take a peek from the door. If we feel safe enough, we're going to enter just right into the to that living room and kitchen and see what we can see and hear what we can hear to see if it, it, is anybody trying to communicate with us, is there anybody laying on the ground, stuff like that. Before, we go let in, me interrupt you just ahead. for a second. Before you enter this residence and do that limited penetration, how long have you been out there? I would say 40, 45 minutes, something to that effect. Okay. Go ahead and tell them what happens when you do that. So when we do our limited penetration, I, we, we make our way into the living room and the kitchen. I look down that hallway. I don't know if there's two or three doors. It's like on that diagram when, it, when I do it. There are several bedrooms and a bathroom there. I don't know if those are all in the, the exact same order they were, but it's a typical single wide trailer layout. There's a hallway down the back. There's doors to my left. There's a back door on the right, and there's a door straight ahead of me. We see several closed doors and a partially open door on the very back room there that's, that's labeled master bedroom. We're at the end of this hallway. We're hollering down. We're not getting any response from anybody. So you are at the end of the hallway we're, where the living room right is? We're right here in this area right here. And you're yelling? Yes. Sheriff's office, we have a search warrant. Daniel, if you're in here, come out with your hands up. Just repeated commands such any as Any response? We get absolutely nothing. Okay. What do you do in response to that? At that point, we decided for officer safety and that we were dealing with a, a, the possibility of a child. And the reason we didn't rush in here is because uh, some limited intelligence had told us, and I don't know if it was through a social worker or who it was, 
that there were some deers and stuff hanging on the wall. We take all that stuff into account when, when we're gonna go serve these warrants. That tells me that this guy's possibly a hunter and possibly has a shotgun or a rifle in his house. In a trailer, you fire a shotgun or a rifle from one or the other, it's liable to go through every wall in there. So once we get in there- Let me interrupt you just for a second. Is that information that you want to obtain anytime you're going out to do a search warrant if you can? Absolutely, the maximum amount of or information we can get about where we're going and what they might have is stuff we use in our briefing and our planning as to the method we're gonna to use to go into the place. So once we get into the living room and kitchen, we're making no contact, we've got multiple shut doors. What we don't wanna do, because it's a single wide trailer and a skinny hallway, is start pushing down that hallway and then have to confront somebody from the side when I've got an empty door in front of us. So at that point, we decide it's safer for us and safer for the people inside if we back out and try to do a negotiated surround the call out again. At that point is when I decided to call for assistance from the Ohio State Highway Patrol SRT team. Okay, they let, have me, the, let me interrupt you just for a second. What is an SRT team? It's the Highway Patrol statewide special response team. They're funded through Homeland Security funds. They have all the bells and whistles and nice toys that I would love to have in situations like that. So we call them and use them. We back out, form our perimeter. I've contacted uh, my dispatch and, and the captain and requested the SRT respond to our location to help us with a barricaded sub possible barricaded suspect. How long does it take for SRT to arrive, approximately? From the time I called for them to the time we approached the house the very next time, they're, they're following in. They're funneling in because they're coming from all over the state, but the. Uh, main vehicle we use with the tools and stuff on it comes from Columbus, Ohio. It's an armored personnel carrier. It's called a Linko Bearcat. It's got the the uh, lighting equipment we needed because of the time of day it's getting. It's got a bigger PA. It's also got robots. It's got less than lethal uh, munitions in it. Stuff to that effect. So it's probably two and a half to three hours after my initial request to the time they get there. During that time. We're not doing it every minute, but every 15, every 20 minutes, we're still trying to make contact inside, come out, come out, come out. Okay, never, about what time was this that you ended up out there? I believe it was 4.30 to 4.45, our initial. Okay. Um, probably before five o'clock, before Jessica exited, and probably getting seven, 7.30 prior to SRT, their team arriving, the equipment arriving that we needed. Okay. And once they arrive, you said, before I go there, you said between the time that you call them and the time that they actually arrive, you're continuing to attempt to make contact. Yes. Are you doing that through the PA system you mentioned? Yes. Okay. Any response? None. All right. What happens after SRT arrives? So, we assemble their team and, and myself, get in their, their vehicle, go down the driveway. Uh, they've decided that they, they want to enter this camper because we want to get right to the front door. They want to go in and clear out that camper and make sure that there's nobody beside us or behind us. So we pull up to the front porch of that vehicle, or of that trailer right here in this area, pointed towards the front porch, a team exits the, our vehicle gets out, clears the camper, there's nobody in there. They start approaching the front door and they do exactly what we had done earlier, a limited penetration. They send a couple of their guys in, they take a look around, they see the same thing we saw, they back out. Pardon me. At that point, they decide it's, it's the smartest thing to do that we'll send the robot in. Okay. Which is what we did. Explain to the members of the jury what that robot looks like and what it does. The robot's probably about the size of that stand that you're using out there to project up onto that screen. Uh, it can climb steps, it can move furniture, it can open doors. It's got a camera on it. It's got several cameras on it. It's got So lights. it's a couple feet tall? Yes. Okay. All right. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, so we deploy it into the house. It makes its way. We can see there's nothing in the kitchen, nothing in the living room. Like earlier, I'm actually in the vehicle where the, the gentleman is controlling this vehicle, and there's a screen in there. As soon as he rounds the corner to look down that hallway, on the screen, I tell him, I said, the gentleman's got to be in there. 
you remember when I told you when we did our limited penetration and looked down the hallway, the door at the end of the hallway was partially open, probably a foot, foot and a half. When they turned the robot down the hallway, that door had been shut. So there's no way anybody got out of there because we had the place surrounded. We knew that he was down there in that room. That robot also has microphone two-way communication on it. Instead of shouting from outside from the cars, you know, now we're talking from it going down this hallway telling whoever's in the bedroom to come out. We get no response again. Uh, they get the robot down the hallway to that door, uh, knock on the door with the robot. It's pretty cool, we can do a lot of things. They don't get any response from that. The door is shut, they can't push it open, so it's got an arm on it. The arm actually articulates and they open the door with the robot. The robot pushes the door open. As that robot makes it into the doorway, the camera pans around and to the left of that doorway, uh, you could see uh, somebody laying in the bed there and they sit up. At the same time that that happened, one of the uh, Highway Patrol SRT team guys did what they call break and rake. It's where they'll break the window and clear anything out of it so they can get a view in from a different angle from the back. That happened at about the exact same time that that robot goes into that. that so they're room. breaking the back windows of that. So yes. Could you use the pointer and show the jury where those windows were located? It was somewhere in this back corner. I don't know if it was on the one or the two side, but okay. it was in the back of the room there somewhere. Okay. But at that point, uh, Mr. Grove stands up. I recognize that it's him through the camera on the thing. He actually looks kind of stunned that there's a robot sitting in his hallway. How do you uh, recognize it as him? I, we have pictures of him prior to going out there that day. Is that also something you do yes. before you execute a search warrant? Yes, absolutely. Okay. And right. at that point, uh, they communicated with Mr. Groves to exit the house. They told him to step over the robot. He stepped over the robot, came to the front door, was met by the SRT team, and taken into custody at that point. They brought him back away from there. I spoke to him briefly, just as I did her when she was brought out. Explained to him why we were there. He said he'd been asleep the whole time. Um, I asked him where the child was, and he gave me the same exact response. Children's Services had come and taken the child. If I could have just one moment. <coughs> Your Honor, at this time I have no further questions. Thank you, Ms. Hutchinson. Uh, Mr. Stratton, you may cross-examine. Thank you, Your Honor. Well, good afternoon, Detective. How are you, sir? Good. You said you were there for about 15 to 20 minutes before Jessica came out? I believe that's correct. Okay. You said you came out screaming. Would you define that as her being belligerent? Aggravated. Belligerent, correct? Probably. Thank you. No further questions, Rob. Mr. Stratton, uh, Ms. Scott, you may cross-examine. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Uh, Ms. Hutchinson, any redirect? No, Your Honor. Is this witness excused? Yes, Your Honor. Excused. Yes, Your Honor. Detective, you're free to go. Thank you. State may call their next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. State of Ohio will call Captain John Murphy. You raise your right hand for me, please. Sir, do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you guys? Please have a seat. Mr. Teeman, you may inquire. Sir, would you state your name for the record? John Murphy. And how do you spell Murphy for the court report? M U R P H Y. Thank you. How are you employed? I'm a captain at the Sidey County Sheriff's Office, overseeing the detective division. How long have you been with the Sidey County Sheriff's Department? Nearly 27 years. How long have you been a captain over the detective division? Uh, this time, right at three years. Uh, were there other roles that you served as a captain as uh, with the Sidey County Sheriff's Office? Yes, I've been a captain over the uh, jail, 
twice, uh, another time as uh, captain over investigations as well as over the 911 communication center. Sir, uh, in, uh, I'd like to direct your attention to January of 2019. Um, uh, and subsequent to that, mid-year 2019, spring, um, did you become a familiar with an, an investigation or an issue involving a child in the custody of the site of County Children's Services? Yes. Um, specifically, did you become familiar with um, an issue regarding a, uh, an infant by the name of Dylan Groves? Yes. How did you become familiar with that matter? Um, I had overheard some conversation between uh, one of the other captains and sheriff dealing with uh, trying to locate the child. Had officers out there multiple times making attempts with children's services, trying to do welfare checks on the child. Uh, and at some point, did you become actively involved in um, looking for this child? I did. Uh, do you recall an incident on May 20th, 2019, here in Sida County with regard to looking for this child? Yes, sir. Um, what uh, roughly was the location of that incident? Uh, 2241 Mount Hope Road. Uh, the sheriff had asked Chief Deputy Miller and myself to go out, take an unmarked uh, pickup truck that we have that's fully equipped with lights and sirens, to go out and see if we can find the groves and the infant. All right. And um, you mentioned 2241 Mount Hope Road. Is that Otway, Ohio? Yes. And is that in Scioto County? Yes, sir, it is. And uh, what specifically were you looking for at that point in time? Specifically, we was trying to find uh, Mr. and Mrs. Groves in an attempt to locate baby Dylan. Okay. And uh, what happened that day? Uh, Chief Deputy Miller and I, when we arrived Mount Hope Road, we went to the location. The driveway was very rough and rutted out. Uh, we had, did have a four-wheel drive pickup truck. We drove up the driveway. At the end of the driveway, it is cabled off. Um, there was motion detectors up on the trees that would indicate anybody that's coming around. Uh, we got out of the vehicle. We walked up to the trailer. There was dogs outside, and you actually hear them inside when we was trying to make contact. Walked around the trailer, never, uh, never observed anybody there, never heard any motion, commotion inside except for the, the animals that was inside. Uh, we actually uh, ended up backing back out of the, the drive because there was nowhere to turn around. And when we backed out, I observed the neighbor directly across, which actually lives at 2242 Mount Hope Road Otway, was outside cutting grass. Uh, pulled into the driveway, got out of the vehicle, walked up, and he was kind of, his back was to me, so I didn't want to walk up and startle him because he was an older gentleman. So I kind of got off to the side where he could see me out of his peripheral vision, so I wouldn't startle him. I told him who it was, he turned the lawnmower off. He said, I know why you're here. I said, well, why am I here? He said, you're trying to locate the groves. I said, yes, I am. I said, by the way, have you happened to see the child? And he said, I have not. And I said, could you tell me when's the last time? He said, I haven't seen the child for, for this half seen it. And I said, well, do you ever see them? He said, well, they leave early morning hours and they come back late at night. They're usually on a four-wheeler riding up and down the roadway. Um, while I was having a conversation with him, I actually could hear what I believe to be a four-wheeler coming down Mount Hope Road. And I asked him when I could see him coming, I asked him, I said, is that them? Is that them? And when I looked, I seen people who I believed was them based on the photos that I had seen of them. And as they passed his driveway, he definitely said, yes, that is both of them. Myself and Chief Deputy Miller ran back, got back in the pickup truck. 
I took out of the driveway and I initiated the uh, siren and the lights on the pickup truck. They slowed down and they went to pull over. As they went to pull over, I tried to maneuver to try to, there was an embankment there and a ditch. So I tried to pull over to kind of try to pin them in. Then when Mr. Groves seen what I was doing, he accelerated the four wheeler and took off through a field and I gave chase through the grassy field and they hit the woods and we could not pursue any further. You had mentioned that you uh, uh, had seen, had, uh, had viewed pictures of uh, Mr. Groves and Mrs. Groves yes. uh, uh, through uh, the sheriff's office? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And um, uh, did you get a good look at them as they drove by on that four-wheeler? Absolutely, I did. The people that you saw uh, on that four-wheeler that day, May 20th, are they in the courtroom here today? Absolutely, they are. They're sitting here at the defense table. Your Honor, if the record could reflect. The record will reflect that the captain has pointed to and identified the defendants, Daniel Groves, and the defendant, Jessica Groves. Um, were you aware of a prior uh, a pursuit or a short pursuit with Daniel on a four-wheeler? I had heard discussion uh, from other officers, but nothing that I knew. No directly. personal knowledge. Yes, yes okay. that's correct. All right. And um, is there any other way that you were personally involved in this, uh, this uh, investigation? Yes, there was. Okay. Uh, that was on uh, June 10th. I um, actually made contact with your office. Myself, Sheriff Denenny, came over and met with you and your staff to discuss the possibility of getting obtaining a uh, search warrant for the property of the Groves. Okay. And uh, were you also involved in uh, the recovery efforts, or at least peripherally, of um, the body of Dylan Groves? Absolutely. And uh, is it fair to say that you assigned a lead detective to that to, that was taking lead on that investigation at that point? I did, Detective Jody Conkle. Right. One moment. Thank you, sir. No further questions, Your Honor. Chairman, uh, Mr. Stratton, you may cross-examine the witness. Your Honor, I have no questions for the captain. Mr. Stratton, uh, Ms. Scott, you may cross-examine. Your Honor, I have no questions for the captain. Thank you. Is this witness free to go? Yes, he is. Thank you, Captain. We'll be excused. Yes, Your Honor. Captain, you're free to go. Thanks, sir. Teamman, you may call your next witness. <coughs> Your Honor, the state would call Jessica Bird. Please. And do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you guys. You may be seated. Ma'am, there is media in the courtroom here today. Do you have any objection to your image being filmed or photographed during your testimony? No objection. No objection. Ms. Hutchinson, you may inquire. Thank you, Your Honor. Ma'am, if you would, please introduce yourself to the jury and spell your last name for the record. My name is Jessica Bird. Uh, my last name is B-Y-R-D. Okay. Where are you employed? At Mahajan Therapeutics in okay. Portsmouth. Where is that located in Portsmouth? Um, it's on Walnut Street. It's actually 52 going back towards like, Riversburg area. It's on the right-hand side, um, right off of that main street, Walnut Street. Okay. How long have you been so employed? Um, since May 1st, 2016. Okay. And if you would explain to the members of the jury what your job title is there and what you do. Uh, I'm a therapist. I'm a drug and alcohol counselor. Um, we do assessments. We also um, assist in diagnosing if they, we notice some of the symptoms that, you know, would benefit the client to be uh, coming to our agency. Um, we do individual sessions with clients, uh, group counseling, drug screening, things like that. 
Okay. Um, prior to your employment at Mahajan Therapeutics in 2016, were you employed in tr drug treatment before that or therapy type treatment before that? Yes, ma'am. Well, what is your previous employment? Um, well, before working at Mahajan, I was at Focus um, Residential for um, eight months. And before that, I worked at Community Counseling and Spectrum and Star Community Justice Center. Okay. Over 12 years and all. Okay, so you mentioned Focus, mm -hmm. Spectrum, mm -hmm. and Community Counseling? Yeah. Okay, and those are all? Drug and alcohol treatment Drug and alcohol centers. treatment centers. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and then you were also employed, did you say, at STAR? Mm -hmm. Okay, what is STAR? Uh, STAR is a community-based correctional facility. Um, I worked there in 2007 to 2012 with a, about an eight-month break in between there. I was a victim advocate at Pike County um, during that eight months through a grant. Um, and so that's... Um, they're a community-based correctional facility. Um, you can't leave. It's locked down facility, but it does um, center around drug and alcohol treatment. Okay, and what was your job title there? Um, I was a therapist, counselor. Okay. If you would, explain to the members of the jury what your educational background is. I have a bachelor's in English Humanities from um, Shawnee State, and I'm a licensed chemical dependency counselor, too. Okay. Let me direct your attention to um, January 2019. Did you have an occasion to do an, an assessment on defendant Jessica Groves? Yes. Okay. And do you recall how that referral came to you? I believe it came from uh, Children's Services. Okay. Um, and then... After that assessment, uh, what was this defendant to do? What did you advise we, her to do? Um, after the assessment, we recommended that she do individual therapy, um, group counseling, both of those two times a week. Uh, women's group we have on a Friday afternoon, so uh, we would have wanted her to go to that as well. And uh, drug testing every time we're there. Okay. And... What's the policy with Mahajan Therapeutics regarding drug testing of patients or clients? We, um, everybody is required to drug screen every time that they're there and they're always monitored and we have people supervising them and, you know, making sure they're not faking it or whatever. When you say faking it, what do you mean? Trying to, um, take a drug, or trying to, you know, have fake urine or take things that might clean their system out, stuff, we have things like that happen, but, you know, well, that's why we have people observing drug okay. screens. And so would she have started treatment that following week? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, you recall how many times that following week she was there? I can't off the top of my head, but I know I saw her for an individual on February 8th, I believe. Okay. I yeah. Do you have records there or notes there with you about this? Okay. Are you referring to those who yeah. refresh your recollection? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, so on the 18th of January, we had made a recommendation to um, have her to do a mental health assessment, um, which is pretty common. You know, usually if you have a drug and alcohol problem, you've usually got mental health issues. And um, I, so I saw her on the 8th of um, February for an okay. individual. Okay. Um, was she, to your knowledge, taking any drug screens during, between assessment on January 18th and uh, February 8th when you saw her? Yes. Okay. How many, do you know? Um, I do not know. You know. I don't know. Okay. To your knowledge, were those... Um, drug screens, what were the results of those drug screens, if you know? They would have been clean because anytime there's a positive drug screen, it's always on my desk and we're always, you know. So you would be notified by your staff? Yes, immediately. Okay. What happens after February 8th? Um, 
she started to become very um, inconsistent and eventually then just totally stopped coming. We have case managers who also try to contact them and get them to be re-engaged. We also try to contact to re-engage a client if they've been not coming. Okay. Um, what types of, what attempts do you make to contact uh, the defendant, Jessica Brooks? We would make phone calls. Um, the case manager assigned to that client might go out to their house even to just try to talk to them to see if they're there. Anything, I mean, you know, we can do to try to get them to come back and help them. That's what it's <clears throat> Okay. Um, you said she was a referral from Children's Services? Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you contact them if there's a non-compliance issue? Yes. Okay, and did you guys do that? Yes. Okay. Do you know how many times? Yes. How many times? Well, we had an attempt to contact her uh, about, she started becoming uh, non-compliant with her attendance. So on the 14th, I had attempted to try to contact Children's Services. Um, and then on the 15th, I did actually speak to her caseworker to tell, okay. tell her she wasn't coming. Um, and then it, on the 19th of February, I attempted to contact Children's Services again to continue to tell them, you know, she's not coming. Let me interrupt you just for a second. When you make these attempts, are you leaving messages? Yes. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, and then on the 22nd was another attempt about her noncompliance because she was not coming at all at this point. I mean, from the 14th and on. Um, 27th, I did talk to a caseworker, and on the 1st of March, I continued to tell them that she's not coming. You're just updating them. She's right. still not coming. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then on the 2nd of April, I actually did speak to her caseworker again. Okay. At some point, did you put a letter in writing and send it yes. about noncompliance? Yes. Okay. Um, between February 8th well, after February, did you have an occasion to see her any more after that? Uh, I did see her one time on the 26th of March. Under what circumstances? It was a group counseling session, and okay. she came in for it. So, apparently, you know, we had thought her, our attempts to re-engage had maybe started to work, that we were going to try to get her back on track. Okay. How long had it been since she had been there, as far as you know? Well, February 8th was when I saw her, and then that March 26th was the next time I actually laid eyes on her. Okay. Uh, so she wasn't coming to individual therapies with you? No. Do you know whether or not she was going to groups? Uh, no, she wasn't going to groups. Okay. How did she appear, or what was her demeanor when you saw her on March 26th? Um, it was a little bit different. I mean, it was kind of, um, she was very defensive. It seemed like she was edgy, a little angry, just upset that Children's Services like, wasn't letting her husband just be with the baby. Um, she just couldn't understand why they were, you know, continuing to did her demeanor cause you any concerns as a therapist in drug treatment? Yes, I noticed it. It was a little, um, you know, like I said, edgy, angry. From my experience, um, behaviors like that tend to represent some methamphetamine use, um, very, you know, just edgy and angry and irritated about things. Okay. Um, there are other services that Mahajan can provide to patients, is that right? Yes. Explain to the jury what those are. Um, we have mental health services that we can provide to the clients. We also have Vivitrol. Um, it's a medicated assisted program um, where we can help a client to get off alcohol and drugs through medicated assisted treatments such as Vivitrol. Okay. And maybe that was probably the way I phrased that question, but do you offer other assistance or services to clients? In other words, like, can you help them with transportation or other things? Yes. Okay. We have case Explain managers. what kind of things you offer there. I'm uh, sorry. Our case managers, they, um, we offer them transportation. We offer them, you know, assistance with counseling, um, assistance with any barriers that they may have in the community um, that need to be addressed. Our case managers are in the field, active, always, you know, working within the community. And 
they will, you know, utilize certain means of transportation to help clients to get there if they can. Okay. I can have this. I have nothing further at this time. Council approach for a moment. Thank you, Ms. Hutchinson. Um, Mr. Stratton, you may cross-examine. Good afternoon, Mrs. Burke. Um, I have a few questions. Um, you have been a uh, therapist, drug and alcohol counselor since 2016? Since 2007. 2007? Yeah. Okay. But you've worked for Mahajan since 2006? Oh, yes, yes. Okay. So you have... I'll just call you a first responder because that's what you are, correct? Mm -hmm. okay. You're right there on ground zero for this drug problem we have here, correct? Yes. You do quite a few assessments, mm -hmm. okay, and you get quite a few referrals. Yes. Whether it's from CPS, mm -hmm. correct? Right. Yeah, you have to answer out loud. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, CPS? Yes. Or even the courts refer yes. to you, okay? Yes. Um, you see a lot of people that need services and they fall out at different times, don't they? Mm -hmm. Sometimes people are start off well, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yes, yeah, you have to speak out. Um, sometimes people start off well, attend a lot of groups and individuals, correct? Yes. And then sometimes people try and don't come to quite a few of them. And then they're, right? Right, yes. And then there's sometimes people are sporadic. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Um, but that's, that's part of recovery, right? As a drug addict, that's part of recovery. Yes. A few steps forward, a few steps back. Correct? Yes. Some, I mean, not every single person. No, but, not every single person. It does happen. It does happen. Okay. Could you just share with this jury the impact that this problem has had You're here on Portsmouth and here in Soda County. Can you just share a little bit of... Why don't you direct your question a little more to the topics of this case, Mr. Stratton? Yes, Your Honor. You've seen how... You're familiar with how this has impacted um, this case, correct? Yes. You have seen other individuals who have failed to comply, just like Jessica did, Jackson. correct? You have seen other individuals fail to comply like Jessica has, correct? Sure, yes. Okay. But you make every effort to reach out to these individuals? Yes, we did. Okay. And you try to bring them back into the fold? Yes. Okay. All right. You said that... You noticed that she was defensive, edgy, angry, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, we're making a recording, so you have to. No, yeah. Um, and you indicated that from your experience, that indicated what type of substance abuse? Possibly methamphetamine, just based off of my experience and seeing the way that clients come in from an assess, you know, to their assessment most of the time. They're, they're fresh off the street, um, so they're, they may have just come off of their high, and they're very edgy and anxiety-ridden, Okay. kind of moving around a lot. Okay. When they are that away, are they more likely to act out, more likely to become violent? Not necessarily always. But you have seen it. Not in my own, with my own eyes. I have not seen someone commit violence while under methamphetamine use. I'm not necessarily saying, you, but you've heard about it, correct? That people have... Yeah, I'm sure that that's part of it. It could be with methamphetamine. It could be with heroin, too. Okay. It, just depending. Okay. Um, and you have followed all the protocol that Mahajan requires? Send out letters, contacts? Yes. Okay. All right. 
No further questions, Your Honor. Mr. Stratton, Ms. Scott, you may cross examine. Good afternoon, Ms. Bird. Good afternoon. Um, you stated that you had a re direct referral from Seta County Children's Services Board um, Agency for Jessica Groves. Is that correct? Yes. Did you have the same referral for Daniel Groves in this case that you're no. aware of? No. Okay. So he was not um, part of any assessment process, not ordered no. um, or um, asked to come to your agency no. that you're aware of, correct? No. Okay. Um, I think Mr. Stratton asked you a little bit about um, violence um, being a, um, and I don't know if, what, what exact word to use, but um, a symptom or a um, um, behavior, a outward behavior of drug usage. And he specifically mentioned methamphetamine or amphetamine use. And you said that's not likely, but it could. Yes. Um, but what about other drugs um, that could be found in the system, such as fentanyl, um, opiates, such as morphine, things like that? What are you asking? About? That if there could be violent behavior associated with those types of drug usage. Possibly, depending okay. on the situation that that person was in. Sure. Okay. Um, so drug usage, in your past experience, your practice, your education, your training, your knowledge, drug usage could lead to violent tendencies, yes. correct? Okay, yes. thank you very much. That's all I have today. Let me redirect. Uh, just, just a few, or well, maybe one. Um, Ms. Bird, did you see the defendant Jessica Groves between March 26th and June 10th? No, ma'am. Do you know whether she reported to Mahajan Clinic between those dates? After that March 26th, I never saw her again. Okay. Nothing further. Any Ms. Scott? That did not prompt anything. Thank you. Thank you. Is uh, this witness excused? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Yes. And you're free to go. Thank you. State may call their next witness. Your Honor, State would call Greg Dunham. For me, please. You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. Please have a seat. Teaman, you may inquire. Sir, would you state your name for the record? Greg Dunham. And uh, if you would spell your last name for the court reporter. D U N H A M is in Mary. And uh, sir, how are you employed? Soda County Juvenile Court. In what capacity are you employed with the Soda County Juvenile Court? I am a uh, intake officer and slash investigation. How long have you been with the Soda County Juvenile Court? Approximately seven years. Prior to being with the Soda County Juvenile Court, were you employed? Yes. Where were you employed? Um, domestic Relations Court. What were your functions up there? I was a bailiff for uh, Judge Spears. How long were you with the Domestic Relations Court? Approximately two and a half years. And prior to being with the Domestic Relations Court, were you employed? Homeland Security. All right. And where was that based out of? Columbus, Ohio. Okay. How long were you with Homeland Security? Uh, approximately a year and a half. Right. At some point, were you with the Sida County Sheriff's Office? Yes, sir. How long were you with the Sida County Sheriff's Office? 26 years. And uh, what was your rank upon, did you retire from there? Yes, I did. What was your rank upon retirement? Uh, captain. Um, what uh, do you do as an intake officer investigator for the Sayada County Juvenile Court? Um, in and out of the schools, in and out of homes, um, basically, um, dealing with truant uh, children, um, abuse, neglect, and then I also run a, a program for Judge Lemons inside. Uh, it's called a treatment tracker. Um, I also uh, talk to people who come in to file charges on children. Okay. What is treatment tracker? It was a. It's a program that was developed by Judge Lemons. 
Um, basically, if a baby is born or if there's a child removed from a home or mother and father are drug addicted, uh, they report to me twice a month to bring in proof that they are doing treatment um, so to help them to get their uh, kids back. Um, sir, I'm going to direct your attention to January of 2019. In your capacity as, uh, let me ask this, are you a law enforcement officer with the Sayada County Juvenile Court? A law enforcement officer? Are you still a bailiff with the Sayada County Juvenile Court as well? I can bailiff, yes. Okay, all right. And um, in, in your capacity with Sayada County Juvenile Court, um, did you become familiar with a case involving um, a mother by the name of Jessica Groves, a father by the name of Daniel Groves, and uh, their two children, uh, Daniel Jr. and Dylan Groves? I, can, I became familiar with Jessica Groves. Okay. How did you become familiar with Jessica Groves? Um, Jessica Groves was ordered by the judge to report to me in the treatment tracker program. Um, she had a child removed. And she was to uh, report to me twice a month. Okay. So um, we, we've already had vast discussion about how that came to be, but was Ms. Groves part of a, a uh, children's services case that was filed for it through juvenile court? Yes. Okay. And as part of that case, was she ordered then to um, report to you, uh, I think you said a monthly basis? Uh, twice a month. Twice a month. Second okay. and fourth. Wednesday of every month. All right. And um, do you see Jessica Gross here in the courtroom, the person you're talking about? Yes, sir. Okay, if you could point her out for the judge. Be the lady to the right of uh, Mr. Stratton. Okay. Reflect that the witness has pointed to and identified the defendant, Jessica Gross. All right. Um, when did you first meet Jessica Gross? Um, may I refer to notes? Sure. Put number one. Do you have your notes with you? Yes. Okay. January 24th, 2019. Okay. So uh, January 24th, 2019, um, where did you meet with Ms. Gross? Would have been in my office or in the juvenile court. Okay. Yes. Um, at that meeting, what, what did you go over? Um, Basically, what she was required to do uh, to report to me. Um, she also met with another employee um, to be at, have an assessment done as to whether or not we could get her into family drug court. Okay, what's family drug court? Family drug court is um, held on Tuesdays. It's um, it's a court that Judge Lemons runs. That is to reunify the the parents back with their kids. Actually, drug addiction. Okay. And does that uh, family drug court sometimes run contemporaneously with a children's services case before the court? Yes, there are, there are children's services cases within the court. Okay. Are there other kinds of cases besides that as well? Yes, there are some that's not involved with children's services. Okay. And um, so when was uh, your next uh, time uh, with Ms. Gross. Did you go over her schedule to come and appear before you? Yes. Okay. She is, um, everybody that reports to me is given a sheet that uh, has the dates that they are to report. Okay. And to your knowledge, in this case, did you give Jessica Gross a sheet? Yes. Okay. Um, so, and just to confirm, was that she was supposed to report twice a month? That is correct. All right. Um, did she continue to report to you? Um, as I previously stated, she reported to me on January 24th. I did not see her again until March 28th. Okay. Um, how did you come to see her on March 28th? She showed up at my office. Um, I believe that was a report date. Okay. Um, did she miss a number of report dates between... 
the first date of uh, January 24th and March 28th. She would have missed three. Okay. So that would have been the um, two in February and an earlier one in March? Yes. Okay. Uh, did she indicate why she missed those dates? Um, told me she could, didn't have a ride. A ride was hard for her. Um, said that she was living in different places in Otway and she was having a hard time finding a ride. Right. Um, had you gone over opportunities for her to be to get a ride at an earlier time? I'm sorry, repeat that please. Uh, were there opportunities or services to provide that for Jessica Groves to get rides to court? Um, not that I'm aware of. I know that um, there are times, and, and especially with family drug court, that we go to, to pick these people up. Did she, give, did she call you or contact you in any way between um, that uh, 24th and the 28th? All right. Did you sanction her at that time? Uh, no, we did not. Okay. Um, and did you see her in that capacity at any other point uh, as the um, intake officer in, in, that, in that regard? No, after that date, I, I never seen her again until later. Till June 11th? Um, at some point, did you become aware that there was an issue with um, one of the children involved in the Groves court case? Yes. Um, when do you recall first learning that there was an issue? morning of May 31st, 2019. Okay. And how did you discover that information? Um, I received a call on May 30th from Judge Lemons asking me if I could meet with him in the office on May 31st that he had uh, wanted to talk to me and discuss with me a, about a case. Okay. And were you, did you receive any instructions from the judge as to course of action uh, that you were to take? On the morning of the 31st, I talked to him and he explained to me that um, Children's Services had uh, met with him on the 30th and that they were having trouble making contact with the Daniels or with the Groves um, and asked me if I would try to make contact with them. Did you attempt to make contacts with Daniel Groves? I attempted to make contact with Daniel and Jessica Brooks, yes. Okay. What efforts did you take? I went to the residence, um, knocked on the door, never got an answer, left a card asking for them to give me a call. Okay. Um, do you have the, do you know what date that was you went to the residence? First day I went to the residence was then May 31st. Okay. You said the first day, were there subsequent dates that you went to the residence? Say it again, please. Were there other dates that you went to the residence? Yes. I went to them um, May 31st. I never received an answer and left a card. June 3rd, I went back out to the residence. Um, again, knocked on the door, never received an answer. there on June 4th with no answer. June 5th. I might have misspoke earlier. It was June 10th the next day you saw Jessica Groves? June 10th? Yes. Were you at the search warrant execution of the house? In the evening hours on June 10th, yes. Okay. I was also there earlier that.
that day. Okay. Did you see anyone earlier that day? No, sir. Uh, did you try to contact any other individuals to locate uh, Daniel or Jessica Groves? Yes, I did. Uh, who all did you try to contact? I got, um, made contact with the neighbor who lived directly across the street. Um, I spoke to him. He advised me that um, he never really spoke with them a lot, but did see them coming in and out of the driveway. Uh, told me they was driving an old red car with the window busted out. But the majority of the time they was on four wheelers. Okay. Four -wheelers, should say. Did you contact other family members to see if they'd seen them? Check with, the, uh, check with the next door neighbor who was not a family member. Um, he told me basically the same thing. Uh, said, told me I was out there at the wrong time of the day. I need to be out there late in the evening. Uh, that he really never seen them during the day. I spoke with a brother, someone who identified me, me as his brother. Uh, and he told me that they really didn't have anything to do with his brother or Jessica. Okay. Um, I'd like to direct your attention to that later evening, June 10th, um, the search warrant execution at the trailer. Um, did you have an opportunity to speak with uh, Jessica out there? Yes, I did. All right. Uh, what did she say to you? Um, Detective Giles placed her in my car when she came out, when they got her, they got her out of the residence. Uh, they placed her in my back seat of my car. What was her initial demeanor like? Old. Okay. Um, did that change over time as you talked to her? Did you inquire about the location of Dylan Groves? I asked Jessica, um, well, first of all, I had a paper to serve her, and I served her the paper and asked her if she remembered me, and she said yes. I asked Jessica about the baby and uh, told her we were worried about the baby, and she, uh, she told me that um, she didn't understand why we were out there looking for the baby. The Children's Services come and got that baby two or three weeks ago. Okay. One moment. Um, did she make any other statements to you with regard to that? In regard to the baby? Yes. Um, no. Okay. Um, there were a number of people that you'd talked to. You recall talking to uh, Daniel's sister. sister? Daniel's sister. Did you talk to Daniel's sister? Well, let me ask it this way. What, what other relatives? You said you talked to somebody that claimed to be Daniel's brother. Were there other relatives you talked to? I spoke to, um, well, I spoke to the Shivers. Okay. Had they seen them? No. Uh, you mentioned Daniel's, uh, had you spoke to anyone else? I spoke to um, Ms. Shivers' sister. Her name escapes me. I spoke to her by phone and also met with, or never met with her. She was going out of town on vacation. I spoke to her by phone. Was there any indication that they had visited her or she had seen them? No. So that, um, Jessica had made contact with her about paying an electric bill and she did pay the electric bill for her. Okay. Other than that, were they aware of their location? Were there other locations in the Otway area that you uh, searched for the Groves? I went to the uh, convenience store there in Raritan, and I spoke to, a, I believe it was an employee and a customer, 
who said they both were aware, both familiar with the two, said they'd been in and out of the store, but they'd never seen the baby with Never seen the baby? No. Thank you, sir. No further questions, Your Honor. Mr. Tiedemann, Mr. Stratton, you may cross-examine. Thank you, Good afternoon, Mr. Donovan. Good afternoon. Just a couple of clarifications here. You had mentioned earlier um, that you met with her on the 24th of January, I believe. Yes. And then you said the 28th of March. Correct. Um, was it the 28th or was it the 27th? Because I know she had a court hearing on the 27th, correct? I'm not familiar. Okay. Uh, testimony earlier from uh, Patricia Kraft said that they had a court hearing on the 27th and that she did a home visit on the 28th. Could your dates be wrong by a day or so? She could have met with me on the 27th and if I hadn't made an entry in our computer system, it would probably put the 28th. Okay. All right. That's probably what the uh, difference is there. Um, uh, you're meeting on the 27th with her, 27th, tw 28th, uh, most likely the 27th. What was her demeanor? Um, that day, um, if my memory serves me correctly, she came in. Um, she was telling me that uh, the father had custody of the, of the baby and, and that she was not allowed around the home. Um, said she was having a hard time getting a ride living with whoever she could find to live with that night. Did she seem, you mentioned on, you mentioned on June 10th that she seemed cold. Did she seem cold that day on March 28th? Did she seem distant? No. No. Was she talkative? She, she was talkative in my office. Okay. Did she answer all your questions? Yes. Okay. All right. Did she have some questions of her own? I can remember. Okay. So just clarify, you saw her on January 24th, March 27th, and then, correct? 27th or 28th. Okay. And then again on June 10th at the, uh, at the residence. Okay. All right. No further questions, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Stratton. Uh, Ms. Scott, you may cross-examine. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Mr. Donovan. Um, you mentioned that you met with her on the 27th. Um, in regards to that original um, case um, that was opened up by Children's Services with Juvenile Court, was there also a referral for Daniel Groves to meet with you in regards to the treatment tracker program? No, ma'am. Okay. Um, did you ever have uh, opportunity to speak with him yourself or to perform a drug screen on him as part of your duties down at Juvenile Court? No, ma'am. Okay. Are you aware... Um, that he would be drug screened um, when he made appearances at juvenile court for cases such as these and abuse neglect dependency cases. Is that typical that parents would be drug screened? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, so if he was drug screened by juvenile court, you have a certain protocol for that. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And are your cups temperature sensitive? Yes. Okay. So um, they would tell some tell the individual giving the test or conducting the test if urine was too cold. Correct. And that would be considered not a proper sample, correct? That's correct. Okay. And so when what is the protocol when you you ju juvenile court um, administers a drug screen to a male person? Where do they go? First of all, in the bathroom. Okay, and I'm assuming there's stalls and urinals in the men's bathroom. That's correct. Okay, are they permitted to use a stall, or they must stand at a urinal? They must go to the urinal. Okay, and so a urinal. Do they have dividing walls on them down there in the men's bathroom? Small walls. Yeah. Small. Okay. Does the do those walls obstruct the person's view of the person? conducting the test and the person giving the sample. I can't speak for the other people who would give those tests, mm -hmm. but I know when I do my test, 
I make them step back if I can't see. Okay. And is that the protocol of juvenile court when administering test? That is my protocol, yes. Okay. Like I said, I, I can't speak for the other is, gentleman. Is there an across-the-board protocol of how the employees are instructed to conduct tests down there in George juvenile court? Observe them peeing into the cup, yes. Okay. So the policy is your office is you go into the room with them. Yes, ma'am. Men stand at urinals, very small walls there, and they are observing the person putting the urine into the cup. Yes, correct? That is correct. I'm sorry? That is correct. Okay. And the cups have a temperature gauge on them. Yes. Okay. Um, and then they're escorted out of the, they're sealed up. They hand them back to the person. Yes. Um, they get sealed up promptly, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, so they don't have opportunity to put water in them, um, dump them out or anything to that effect, correct? No. Okay. In this case, you don't have any records, though, on you of Mr. Groves giving a urine sample because he was not part of the treatment tracker program. I've never spoke to Mr. Groves. Thank you very much. I have no further questions. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Any redirect? No, Your Honor. Any further questions? No, Your Honor. Is this witness, no, Your Honor. Thank you. Is this witness free to go? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. He may be excused. Thank you. No, you're free to go. Thank, Thank you for your time. Thank you. Gentlemen of the jury, uh, I believe today's uh, made good headway in the case today. We are going to take our evening recess at this time. I am going to remind you of my earlier admonition. Do not discuss this case amongst yourselves or with anyone else. Do not permit anyone to discuss it with you or in your presence. It is your duty not to form or express an opinion on this case until it's finally submitted to you. I'm going to ask that you be here at 5 till 9 in the morning, and we'll start the uh, third day of testimony, uh, hopefully right at 9 o'clock. This time, court is recessed. I release you to the care of the bailiff uh, and he'll release you from the jury room. Right? Some folks can back the chair.